so I'm standing at the top of this hill with my face covered. And I remember the police just in the car just pointing right at me. And they've started gunning up the hill. So I've taken this knife out and launched it into a hedge. And it's bounced off the hedge and hit, hit the pavement. And I've just started running towards the police because I felt they're coming towards me. So if I can run, that I felt as if if I ran back the way, they'd catch up to me. But if I ran that way, they'd need to turn around and I'd, I'd maybe buy a couple more seconds. So when I've ran down past them, one of them's jumped out the car. I didn't anticipate the fact they could jump out the car. So one's jumped out the car and ran after me. And the car's done a, a bully, is what they call it in Scotland. Effectively a U-turn. I've ran around the corner. The police officer's caught me, flung me to the ground, arrested me, and put me in the back of the car. So I remember one of the police officers saying, we seen him throw something away. So the police has went away, and they've came back with a lot back knife that someone else had thrown away. And then the way back for the shops, I heard like commotion in the park. And I heard this guy shouting. So I had a drink in me, and I'm like, all right, moan then. And I've walked into the park. And the guys just walked right up to me and like, banged me in the heat. And I just suddenly felt my head, like, as if this pressure just come in my head. My head started bleeding. It stabbed me in the head. It stabbed me. I don't know if you can really see it. It's here. You can't really see it. But see, see doing that part of my hairline, a vein runs down it. So what he'd done, he'd stabbed me in a blood vessel. So instantly blood started gushing from my head. So what he said was, that's Azikis. So in Scotland, we use a term called equis. It essentially means equal. So he's saying, that sounds equal, but you stabbed me, I've stabbed you. But I've just been stabbed. I'm steaming drunk. I was like, not a chance, come here you. So I've started fighting with this guy. And uh, we've been in this fist fight and I'm getting punched. I'm getting punched. I'm losing a lot of blood. They'd arrested me, cuffed me, restrained me, then taken me away down the stairs. But when the police have ran in that flat, they've ran down the stairs. And one of the guys has had an axe in one hand and an iron in the other. And at the last minute, he's ditched the axe under a couch. The police has ran in and he's attacked one of the police officers with the iron. Burst the guy's face open. Then he's ran in a bedroom, shut the door, thrown the iron off the balcony. Bear in mind, this is 11 floors up. Pulled his trousers down and starfished the bed as if to pretend he's sleeping. So the police have ran in, arrested him, tied him up the exact same. Hello everybody, many of you watched Channel 4's Banged Up recently, it had several of our podcast guests in it, Chet, Kevin Lane, etc. Welcome to 5.0, oh, 5.0 oh was in it as well, and he's up in Glasgow, and Glasgow, out of all the cities, I'm finding just the best stories are coming out of Glasgow, Paul Ferris, Ian Blake MacDonald, We've, we must be up to like almost 10 people now we've interviewed out of Glasgow, but... It's just, there's a lot happens up there. So a huge thank you for coming on, 5-0. Ah, uh, you're welcome, mate. Thanks very much for having me. And it's, uh, the thing with Scotland is Glasgow is the place to know. It's the place to be and it's the place with the people to meet. Anywhere else, shite. Shite, Glasgow's <laughs> the place to be. I'll be honest, no, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you on your podcast, Sean, no, I mean, I'll say it how it is. Glasgow, Glasgow is the mecca of Scotland. I went up there to meet Johnny Boy Steele and he showed me around uh, Balleny Prison and all that. It was, yeah, impressive. Oh, but did let's... you was that the ticket outside of it, was it? Yeah, how he escaped. He showed me where he escaped and everything. Really? Aye. But, but um, we're going to get into 5 0's story. We're going to jump forward to quite a dramatic story and we're going to go back to his growing up, what it was like. But he's a hell of a storyteller, very charismatic, as you'll see, and um, really honoured to have you on and to spend time with us today. So, thank you, and something happened to you when you were a teenager and you ended up getting charged with attempted murder. Do you want to lead us into that one? Yeah, so basically, I was 17 at the time, and hanging about in Glasgow back then, this was roughly about 2010, 2009, 2010, gangs were quite a big thing. I know I understand in England there's a, a big problem with gang violence. Back in Glasgow at that point, when it was probably near enough roundabout at its height, so I used to carry lockbacks, like knives, and uh, it wasn't for any intention or purpose of using it. So I told myself I wasn't, I wouldn't ever class myself as a violent person, but it was more of a respect thing. 
it was kind of to be seen to be carrying a knife. So people instantly kind of gave you that respect. So I had been seeing this girl, uh, and it was a really toxic, I wouldn't even say toxic relationship, it was a toxic situation ship because it was never really a relationship. I was young, naive, thought I was in love, and uh, she was a potato scone short of a fry up, we like to say in Scotland. So, <coughs> so uh, basically, I'd been seeing her for a number of months, and I was attending a 21st birthday party. And uh, I was there with a friend, a couple of friends, and one of my friends at the time was in a relationship with her sister. This is the girl I was seeing, her sister was in a relationship with a friend of mine. <clears throat> so basically, I was at this party, drinking, just enjoying myself. And uh, when I've left this party, this girl I've been seeing, she's messaged me. She's been kind of trying to kind of argue with me all night, just that way, just been a pest. And she'd said to me she was in this house and this guy has came back for the party and told her that I was flirting with her sister. So immediately I was kind of, I was I was pissed off. I was like, that never happened. And uh, for the point that she'd been winding me up so much, I feel I was just at that bubbling point. I was ready to blow. So that night when I'd been arguing with her, I'd been taking white. And at that point, I never really used to take it, but this would lead to become like a recurring problem later on in life, but I'll go on to that. So when I've left this party, we were going back to the, let's just say the my girlfriend at the time, right? We'll just use that just to make it a bit simpler. So we went back to my girlfriend's sister's house for a party, but I was armed with this knife and I was like, that. Well, I'm not letting this go. So I went round to the house that my girlfriend was in at the time with this guy that had been saying this stuff. So he was in the house because his it was his house that my girlfriend was with his sister, if I'm not confusing that too much. So I went round, I've been banging the door, banging the windows. I don't really remember banging the windows. I just, the police told me this later on. And uh, the doors opened and my girlfriend's pal, a friend, has answered the door. And I'm drunk, shouting and bawling, saying, get him out here. I want to fight him. And she was telling me to go away. And we were having a back and forth at the door. And the guy I was looking for, he's appeared behind my girlfriend's friend. So I've started shouting at him, telling him to get out in the garden for a square go or whatever I was shouting. I was just telling him to get outside. And he's been arguing back. And eventually... He's just jumped over this girl and punched me in the face. So I was 17 at the time. He was like 21. So I've always been quite a tall guy, but he had a bit more meat on him. So uh, we've ended up getting in a fight. One of the ones that's like, he's holding my collar, I'm holding his collar. And uh, he's punching me. But as he's punching me, I'm stabbing him with this knife. And at the time, because I'm getting punched, I'm drunk. To me, it didn't feel like I was stabbing him. It felt as if the knife was bouncing off him. I'd never stabbed any, anybody before, so I didn't... I, I always imagined it to be a, a much more dramatic affair. Like, you would stab somebody, they'd start screaming and collapse. That wasn't how it turned out. I was stabbing it. It was like punching him. So as I was stabbing him, the lock back knife, it kept folding over onto my finger. So I've actually got... I don't know if you can really see it there. I've got some scars there in my finger. And it's a bit numb there. So this has happened. He's still punching me, none the wiser to the fact that I'm stabbing him. Then I just remember I was in mid-swing with this knife and he's just collapsed. But as he's collapsed, the the range of motion with this swing has caught him in the face. And as it's hit him in the face, it's just dragged right down his cheek. And I remember it, it kind of it was reminiscent of a like, see a bit of chalk on a chalkboard. It was like, did, 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 did. So it was, that was the knife dragging along his teeth. So he's hit the ground, and his mum, his mother, has jumped in front of him and went like, that's enough. And at that moment, I kind of got a bit of composure together, and I looked at my hands, and the friend who was at the door, the girl that I was, that was kind of blocking, that answered the door initially, she came over, and she looked and she said, did you just stab him? And I kind of looked at my hands and I seen blood all over my hands and the knife. And immediately she just started crying. 
and then I've just been like, I need to get out of here. So I've ran around the corner, thrown the knife into a garden. It was roughly, it was like the start of January, so there was snow laying down. Made no plan to really hide it. I just flung it over a fence and ran. I went back around to my girlfriend's sister's house because it was a party in full swing. I went up, washed the blood off myself and just continued to get drunk and party. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, she phoned me. She was saying, why did you do that? What was that for? And I told her because this guy had been making up lies saying I'd been flirting with your sister. And she said, no, he didn't. He was having a laugh. He was joking. So the way she'd spun it is if this guy's been serious, making up these wild accusations. But the guy was joking with her. But I had acted on it, so the fault lies with me. So within about two days, the police came, arrested me. I'd heard through the grapevine he was in a high dependency unit. It's basically like intensive care. So it was touch and go whether he would survive or not. I get taken to the police station and that's when I kind of realised, right, this is serious. So I get remanded for that. I get sent to Pullman Young Offenders Institution. And when I arrived there, I was still quite naive with it because I'd never really done a sentence before. I'd done like a couple of weeks on remand, but I'd never, I was new to like sentencing guidelines and that kind of thing. So for me, I tried to pin the blame on him. I tried to say he came out with a knife tried to attack me, I disarmed him and stabbed him seven times and slashed him. So, obviously, that wasn't going to fly. So, as time went on, I just settled into the remand and I got a QC. So, in Scotland, if you go into court, you'll have a lawyer represent you. But when you go to the high court, you need something called a Queen's Council. Just basically like a lawyer, but I think of a much higher calibre or more esteemed acclaim, so they call it a KC, you know, it was a Queen's Council, now it's a King's Council, so I got a QC, his name was Tommy Ross, and I remember when he came up to me, he came up to visit me in Pullman, and they asked me, he's like, right, what do you expect you might get for this crime, sentence-wise? And I was like, two, maybe three year, four years tops, and he's like, I'll be honest, you're looking at about six or seven years for this, so that's when it kind of, the seriousness of it hit me. I was like, all right, I might be in here for the foreseeable future. So eventually, when it's went to court, it's been reduced to a charge of assault to severe injury, permanent disfigurement into the danger of life. It's pretty much an attempted murder. So I pled to it. I had witness statements against me. The story I'd concocted about him try to attack me first, me attacking him. I'd pretty much stuck myself in with this story. So going to trial, I would have been found guilty without a shadow of a doubt. So I went up. It was the day after I turned 18, day after my 18th birthday. It was the 10th of June, 2010. And I was sentenced to four and a half years in Pullman. So at that point, I've kept... I went. I remember going back to Pullman. I was in a place called Blair House. It's like an under 18s hall in Pullman. And I went back there. And I remember just sitting on my bunk. It was all single cells in Blair House. And I just remember taking my trainers off, my shoes, and just thinking, right, I better get comfy because uh, I'm here for the foreseeable. But uh, at that point, it was like 2010. My, my release date was 2013. So for me... 2013 might have well as been 2030. It just it seemed so far ahead in the future. It was just, it was hard to foresee it. So I, I just went and got on with the sentence. Uh, I get moved up to the long-term prison hall. So that's basically, when I turned 18, I get moved into the older hall. So in young offenders institutions, it's probably the same in England. You're there from the ages of 16 to 21. So Blair House was an under 18s hall. So once I turned eight, I had turned 18 the day before I get sentenced. So the minute I get sentenced, I get moved out the hall to the over 18s hall. This was a long term or so. So this had like people doing lifers, doing really long sentences. I was just still really young, so and I was just starting my sentence, never done a sentence before. So with that hall, there was a lot more people just settled in. Because people were in for the long haul. They're just they're just kicking back, relaxing. 
some people were doing a bit of time up there. So from then on, I just get into the gym. I just, the way I seen it, I'm in here for the foreseeable future. Like, I want something to show for it when I get out. I don't want to be one of these people that day put three years in the jail and then get out with nothing. So the way I seen it, if I could get massive, hench, then it's no been for nothing, if that makes sense. Yeah, let me stop you here, Five O. You've told that brilliantly. It is a hell of a brutal story. And I'm, I imagine the viewers are thinking, you know, the same thing as me at this point. What the hell led up to this? What was your life like before it? Um, and I'm also just want to add for the viewers as well that Five O is a reformed man now. We're going to get to that. There is a redemption arc to this story. But just give us a bit of background. You know, what was it like for you growing up in Glasgow? So when I was growing up, my life was fairly normal to a working class standard like my mum and dad were together up until the age of five my mum and dad were together i've got an older brother and an older sister there's a fair bit of time between us i think my sister's like nine years older than me my brother's about 14 years older than me i'm probably wrong about the estimates hang me later but they're much older right they're a fair bit older so when I was about the age of five, my mum and dad split up. I don't remember it. I don't remember how it happened. I just remember one minute they were together and the next minute they'd split up. My mum moved into a place called the Moss Heights. That's in Cardonald in Glasgow. It's in the south side. And it's like a block of high-rise flats. So when my mum moved in there, she took me and my sister with her. My brother stayed with my dad. And... My mum, she was just very protective of me because I was the youngest. So she didn't like me going outside and hanging about the local area because she feared that I would hang about the local gangs and get into trouble. So she would just try to protect me. So initially, when I was young, I spent a lot of time in the house playing the computer. I'd done a lot of reading. I can't remember the first book I read or what got me into reading, but I've got one of these mindsets where if I acquire an interest in something, I get obsessive about it. I used to like, read like full books in a day and stuff like that. I just literally go for dust to dawn reading books outside of school. So when I was going through school, I developed this obsession about being the best in my class academically. I would race to finish my work first. If we get given homework, I would finish the homework before we get sent home. If somebody finished their work before me in class, I would get upset, I'd get annoyed in that. And yeah, man, I, I was I was really committed to it. So I eventually left primary school and went into secondary school. And that's where everything changed. Because immediately, when you're in primary, life is a lot more innocent. In secondary school, you're... In a much larger peer group, you've got people immediately judging each other. It's like you're going through puberty, you're going through, you're, you're maturing into an adolescent. So I've always been tall, really tall. I used to be chalk white, gaunt looking. So I always stood out, which made me a target for a lot of people trying to pick on me. And at that point in time, I was really sensitive. Because I wasn't used to it. I hadn't really been out into the big bad world to experience it. So I didn't like it because of the way inclined I was that I wanted to be the best in the class and all that kind of stuff. That made me a target also. So I decided that I didn't like being a target. I wanted to fit in. So I started kind of acting out. I stopped focusing and trying to be the best in the class, I actually started focusing on misbehaving. Not because my nature is to be badly behaved, it was so people could accept me. So that way I could stand out and be funny, I would just start a bit of becoming a class clown as such. So by doing that and just doing outlandish stuff, I started to get a lot more social acceptance. And when I look back at that point, that's when... That became almost an obsession for me, is being socially accepted, because I would strive, right, what can I do now? What, what can I do now? I'd go into like home economics, bake a cake, just so I could go down the corridor and throw it at somebody. Just 
stuff like that. Just very mischievous. So, my, like, I would do things like, I wouldn't bring my work in. Say I was in a class called Modern Studies, and uh, one of the rules of this class was, if you didn't bring your folder in, you would get a punishment exercise because you forgot your stuff. So I would bring my stuff in, it would be in my bag, and I would pretend I, I forgot to bring it in just to get a punishment exercise. So it would look like, oh, I've got a pony. That's what they used to call them, a punishment exercise. So I would just self-sabotaging. That's what I was doing. So I was still quite academically gifted. I remember my English teacher, her name was Mrs. Hartness, a quite a middle-class woman. Really didn't like me just because of my behaviour in her class. So back then, the grade system worked. It was called standard grades. So when I was doing my exams, the grades would work from, if you got a one or a two, that was classed as a credit. That was the highest level you could achieve. If you get a three and a four, that's a general. That's like the halfway mark. If you get a five or a six, that was a foundation level. That was like the bottom rung of the ladder. And if you got a seven, that was just a failure. So she had forecast everybody's exam results. So they would give like a predicted mark before you went to actually do the exam. So she predicted me to achieve a level of five for my English exam, a foundation mark. I done my exam and I got a two, a credit, really high. And I remember actually going back into her class with it and like, rubbing it in her face, saying, look, you predicted me to a five and I got a two. And she, to her credit, she didn't really bat an eyelid. She was like that. Listen, yeah, you're really intelligent. You just don't apply yourself and you act like an idiot. So I, I actually, after we'd done my exams, I should have went back into her class because hers was a credit class. I went back into her class and she refused to teach me. She sent me into another class and then uh, eventually I, I, I get popped out of that. But whilst in school, I was roughly about 14, I started kind of going out and hanging about and uh, I met a few people in school that hung about with the local gangs. So I started quite quickly hanging about a gang, no quit the area. And then that's when stuff really started to get a bit worse for wear. Like I was going home, getting taken home by the police, getting pulled by the police, but I was taking pride in it, getting into school and telling people, and people were like, ah, what are you doing, man? And uh, I had hung about with this, I'd hung about a place called Hillington, that's right next to Cardonald. And I scheme hopped and went to hang about with the rival gang, Penalty. So I just, was, I was friends with somebody that done it and I just hang about with them. The way I seen it, it was innocent, but it wasn't an innocent thing to do. So that kind of made me a bit more of a target as well. Uh, I eventually got stabbed for that when I was about 14. And it was for a guy for Penalty because I used to hang about Hillington. He stabbed me with a lot back knife, stabbed me three times. Like, the what, what led up to that, five oh? Led up to what, getting stabbed? Yeah. So, it was completely random. Like, I used to be very timid. I, I wasn't like a fighter. I always preferred to get on with people. And I remember it was like all the older ones, they were hanging about the shops, drinking and that. I never used to drink at this age. I never really liked it. And uh, I remember walking around the back of the shops and someone says it, you used to hang about Hillington. Uh, Hillington, that's what we call it. Just say Hillington, in case you're wondering why I say it differently. I used to hang about there, and I was like, aye. <laughs> it's like, then they see it as a big deal. And I remember one of them just jumped off the wall and walked towards me and, and done that. And I thought he just punched me, and I was kind of like, what the f I just, uh, so I remember one of them just jumping off the wall, and it just felt like he punched me. And I was just kind of like, I just, I didn't really, I didn't see a knife in his hand or nothing. So I just thought it was just a stupid carry on punch. So as I've walked back around the front of the shops, I looked at my shoulder and I just seen this big red patch and it was blood. And I realised I'd been stabbed. So I remember I was staying with a friend of mine and I wasn't wanting to go to the hospital. I didn't want to go because I didn't want my mum to find out. So I went to stay with my friend and his mother, to her credit, she seen it and she said, right, you need to go to hospital. And took me to hospital, then uh, 
she informed my mum. She okay, she had to let her know. She's like, ah, look, I need to let your mum know. You can't hide it from her. But she's fair enough to her. She's your mother. I totally understand that. And yeah, uh, after that, for me at the time, I was more worried, kind of, right? Does that mean I'm going to get this every time I get down here? But the guy apologised for it afterwards. He says, sorry, uh, listen, I was drunk, all that kind of stuff. And at that time, I was really young. So I was just like, I felt I was relieved because I thought that was me going to get this uh, a beating or a stabbing. Every time I seen this guy, I was kind of, I was paranoid. So at the time, I just kind of, right, okay. Because that was like quite a recurring theme when I was younger. Like people used to pick on me a lot. People just punch me for nothing. And I wasn't much of a fighter back then. So I would just let them. I would just, I wouldn't do anything back. And it happened quite often. And uh, that's a thing that would cause me issues later in life. Because see, suddenly, well, I do a bit of boxing now. And uh, see if somebody punches me in the face, see, and you get that ringing sensation, it's like, mm, that, I flip my lid when that happens because it brings me back to when I was younger and people were doing that. So it's something that kind of transformed and uh, made me a lot more reactive in uh, violent situations. So as I say, I get back to school and it was just drifting in and out, just kind of drifting through. School I had no vision for like, my future or anything like that. I just I didn't really know. Didn't really know what, what to do, didn't know what would interest me. I just didn't have a clue. Eventually left school, probably when I was about maybe 15 or that, 15, 16. And I, I just hung about the streets the way I see it. I turned 16, said to my mum, you can't tell me what to do anymore. I'm free as such. So my life just began living for the weekends. I was drinking. Uh, we'd drink at the weekends, go out, and that's all I would do. My my full life would be geared towards Friday. The Friday feeling, they call it in Scotland. You'd just be geared towards Friday, going out, hanging about the streets, drinking. I eventually started taking pills, uh, party pills, and I would do that. That became my thing. Every weekend I would have a drink and I would pot a couple, and that was it, I just, I'd go about loving everybody, hugging people, kissing them, and all that, consensually, consensually, of course, but as time went on, I never really took white or anything, tried it once or twice, and never done anything for me at the time, but uh, obviously I was gang fighting at that, and that's when I started carrying knives, because at that point in time, I didn't have confidence getting into a fight or a gang fight. I probably would have avoided a fight if I could. But if I had a knife, people gave me that respect. I didn't need to earn it from a fight. I didn't need to do any outlandish behaviour. If I had a knife, just the mere possession of a knife or a sharp instrument or some form of weapon instantly gave me that kind of gratification, that external validation and that acceptance which I spoke about before. So, gang fights, the ones I participated in were nothing more than cat and mouse. We chase them, they chase us, we fling some bricks and bottles, they do the same. The odd time somebody maybe get punched in the back of the head, it was, it was child's play. And I remember, one day, I was due to go to the Dominican Republic with my family the next day. So the day before that, I just decided to go out. So I'm going to go out for a wee bit, hang about. So I went out and when I went down to Penalty, everybody was planning to go for a gang fight. So I'm like, ah, right, I'm coming. So I remember everybody's getting handed weapons and such like that. So I get this big kitchen knife. But I was worried, I was like, ah, right, because the area we were going to, I stayed in the area. So I used to stay in Cardonald, but we used to kind of fight with Cardonald. I never really used to get involved, but the way I seen it, if I don't go with them, I'm going to be left in penalty myself. So I kind of need to go with them. So I got a tracksuit top off of somebody and wrapped it around my head like a balaclava because I didn't want them to see my face and... 
I was going on holiday the next day, so I, I felt as if this would be an appropriate disguise. So we went up, and as I say, it was cat and mouse chasing each other. Nothing really happening. And I was up at the top of this hill. It was like a road, so it was, I was up the top of it. And I just remember I seen a police car coming round the corner at the bottom. And as I say, I've always stood out. I've always been very tall for my age. So I'm standing at the top of this hill with my face covered. And I remember the police just in the car just pointing right at me. And they've started gunning up the hill. So I've taken this knife out and launched it into a hedge. And it's bounced off the hedge and hit, hit the pavement. And I've just started running towards the police because I felt they're coming towards me. So if I can run, that I felt as if if I ran back the way, they'd catch up to me. But if I ran that way, they'd need to turn around and I'd, I'd maybe buy a couple more seconds. So when I've ran down past them, one of them's jumped out the car. I didn't anticipate the fact they could jump out the car. So one's jumped out the car and ran after me. And the car's done a, a bully, is what they call it in Scotland. Effectively a U-turn. I've ran around the corner, the police officer's caught me, flung me to the ground, arrested me, and put me in the back of the car. So I remember one of the police officers saying, we seen him throw something away. So the police has went away, and they've came back with a lot back knife that someone else had thrown away. So they were just like that. That's what we seen him throw away. So I get arrested and get detained. This was my first kind of serious crime. I'd Spent done like a couple of hours in the cells before, but this was like the first serious charge. So I remember getting taken to the police station and I was I was asking to speak to like the deputy sergeant because uh, I had a holiday to go to the next day. So I had special reason to be released. And the guy's like, ah, you're not going anywhere, mate. You're going to court tomorrow. So I spent a night in the cells, went to court the next day, missed the holiday. And I... Uh, got released on a 77 curfew. So it was 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. I had to be in the house. At that point, I had a bit of a victim complex. I blamed everybody for my problems. I had compulsive blaming other people disorder. <laughs> and so because the police had found a lockback knife that someone else had thrown away and not the kitchen knife that I'd thrown away, I therefore was innocent of these charges against me. So if I'm innocent of these charges, then I've got no need to stick to a 77 curfew. That was my thinking, right? So I never stuck to the curfew. I was released on a Monday, and that Friday, I breached the bail and got caught by the same police officer that arrested me for the knife. The guy was singing. See, as he was putting me in the back of the, the van, he was singing. It was something like breakfast in the jail or something like that. So... That was my first taste of a weekender. You call that the Friday to Monday. And yeah, man, it was a traumatising experience. I remember thinking at the time, I'm never doing this again. I will stick to this curfew. I'm not doing this again. Because anybody that's done a weekender, it's, you're lying in a blue mattress. You get fed microwave meals. You get two a day. You get lukewarm tea. You're sitting listening to people banging. It is one of the most horrible experiences you can encounter. So I was released in bail after that. I was given a second chance uh, on the bail conditions. And I stuck to the bail for another two weeks. <laughs> then I eventually breached it again. And at that point, I was 17 days away from a, a pleading diet. So you would go up, you would get a pleading diet, whether you would plead guilty or not guilty. If you pled guilty, you would get we'd come back some time later for a sentencing hearing, or if you pled not guilty, you'd come back for a trial. So because this latest breach of bail was 17 days away from my like, pleading diet, they just remanded me. So that was my first time in Pullman. So because your fingerprints weren't on that knife, did you beat that case? No, no, because in Scotland, see... If two police officers say they've seen you, in this case, throw a knife away, that's evidence enough that, that they would only get like, fingerprints if there was like, disputable facts. Say, say, for talk's sake, I might have 
been implicated in some sort of crime and they found a knife in a different location to tie that knife back to me, they would do fingerprints. But because they both seen and said in their statements, they seen me throw the knife away, then that's proof in a Scottish court that I flung the knife away. I did take it to trial. I took it to trial. I actually remember I took the dock and I basically, <laughs> I remember at the time, they said to me, right, whose knife is this? And I says, I'm not a, I'm not a grass. I said that in the dock. There was police in the gallery laughing at me. But I was taking this dock. I was, the guys like that, swearing me. Out, you know, and they bothered me. <laughs> I was, I was only 17. So the fact, I ended up getting sentenced to community service and probation. How, how that happened, I don't know. But uh, I, justice was on my side that day, but it, it was... It wasn't the last, let's just say that. So what happened with the kettle? So when I get remanded to Pullman, I went up, and I'd only, my only experience of prison had been the stuff I'd seen on TV. There was a show called Boys Behind Bars that was on TV sometime before that, and that gave everybody a glimpse into what life in Pullman was really like. And you probably know yourself, Sean, see, when you meet people that, I've never been in jail and that and probably I've been like that myself as well. You're always curious, you're like, what how does it happen? What actually goes on? Especially like in Scotland. My own experience when I was younger was seeing like American TV shows that were in jail and you know, like, how close is this to the real thing? So there's always that element of curiosity. It's kind of like a very, very, very depressing Disneyland. So for me. There was that kind of, that element of curiosity, like, right, I've been remanded, no good, but I'm going to Pullman. It's like, it was like I was going to the zoo, and in many ways it was like going to the zoo, pardon me. So, I remember going up on the bus, uh, and that way, there was me and another guy that had been remanded, and we were first offenders, they would class it, first time in prison. But there was another guy in the bus who was down at court from prison. So we were interrogating this guy. And the guy's telling this other boy I'm with, he's like, ah, right, see, when you go in, just ask to see a doctor, ask to see a nurse. Say you're, you feel it doing yourself in. Say you're depressed, you miss your children and that, and you'll get put in a detox. So this other guy's like rubbing his hands, jackpot. So... He ended up going in and saying that, all this stuff this guy told him, and they went and put him in suicide watch. Lock, locked him in a cell, 24-hour lights, the television is behind a panel, blue mattress, done him a belter. So I remember going up, and when I first got there, I remember the thing that stuck out to me when they'd done the strip search. I had never been strip searched before. I'd never really stripped naked in front of a man before, but by on order, by his order. So it was kind of like, as I say, I was 17, so it was quite immature. I was like, oh, I can't believe this. So, uh, and I remember when they took my clothes off me, they all get, gave us overalls. See, you had to wear, see from the reception until you got to the hall. When you get to the hall, they would give you like prison garment. So they gave us all overalls, but like, the sleeves are like up to your elbows. There was a guy that was like five foot something, that had, it looked like he was wearing a parachute, all mismatched. And we're walking up this corridor, it's called the route. So it's like a big steel tunnel with a concrete floor. And you're kind of like, ah, right, I'm in the jail, I'm in prison. So it was kind of like a, it was like being in space. It was like a bewildering experience. So I went up to a hall called Iona One. So that's the remand hall in Pullman. And when I went in there, I got dubbed up, and then they call it padded up in England. I get put in a cell with this guy, and I don't know if they call it this in England, but in Scotland we call it a co-pilot, basically the person you share a cell with. His name is Sean Craig, and he was from Royston, and he was in for the same thing as me. He'd been out in bail for a knife, or I think it might have been a knife, it was something like that, and he'd been done with a breach of bail. So he was in the last week of a five-week remand, so he was roughly the same age as me, really nice guy. So he kind of 
broke me in, told me, right, this is what goes on in here. Can I fill me in that, that kind of thing? And he's asking me, do you know anybody that's in prison? And I says, a guy, a guy Ryan I was friends with, he was in Pullman, as far as I knew. And he's like, really? He's like, he's next door. So he's banged the wall. And uh, the boy I was pals with, he's came to the window and turns out he was next door to me, like literally through the wall. So it was kind of handy in that respect. I got there, right? He gave me some stuff in. And I, he was able to kind of, no take me under his wing as such, but he kind of showed me the ropes a bit. And it was good. Like, see, when you go into prison, that's the biggest thing there. You're like, like, right. You're hoping there's somebody you meet that you know. Because then there's someone you can talk to. Because it's quite an intimidating experience just getting in and you're the new guy in the hall. Especially if you've never been to jail before. See, if you've been in jail before, it's a bit easier because you know how to kind of navigate the system. Whereas if it's a new experience to you, you're like a small fish in a very big pond. So I've ended up settling in. As I say, I was very immature at the time, so I just thought it was a big laugh. The way I seen it, I was in 17 days. I was adamant I was getting out. There was not a lawyer, God himself, could have came down, parted the clouds and said, mate, you're not going home. You're not going home. And uh, I wouldn't have listened to him. I was dead set that I was leaving. So I just treated it as a pure laugh. At the windows, winding people up. I thought it was just bamming people up left, right and centre. And uh, I eventually... In the last week, I was dubbed up with this guy for Stirling. The guy, he was English, but he stayed in Stirling, so he had an English accent. So I just started winding him up because I just, I was young, I was 17, so I found it hilarious. I used to try and set his mattress and fire and all that stuff and just do stupid things and pure annoy him. And I think he was finding his, like, his time in quite hard. I think he tied somebody up. But uh, I, looking back now, I feel bad for him. Not I'm talking about, but uh, at the time, I was young. I was young, young, dumb and full of... I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I've got some exciting news to announce. Michael Francis is coming back to tour the UK in 2024. The remade mentor, the Michael Francis story. Michael Francis, once named one of the 50 most significant mob bosses in the USA by Fortune magazine, and a former member of the notorious Colombo crime family, will take you deep into the world of organized crime, sharing captivating tales and insights into the Mafia's past, present, and future. Join us for an unforgettable evening with Michael Francis, the original Goodfella, as he exclusively sits down with myself, Sean Atwood. With me as the host, there's going to be a no-holes-barred exploration of Michael Francis' life, including his numerous arrests and jury trials that ultimately led to his pleading guilty to a federal racketeering charge, a 10-year prison sentence, and $15 million in restitution. You will have the unique opportunity to ask questions during an audience Q&A session, making this event a must-see for true crime enthusiasts and anyone curious about the underworld. Don't miss this explosive in-conversation with Michael Francis. Live on stage in the UK, this exclusive in-person event will be held in various locations in the UK, Ireland and Scotland. Link in the description box below this video if you want to grab yourself a ticket. Back to the podcast. Cheers. But, so my friend next door, he was aware that I was getting out and he was still going to be in the prison. So he says, look, we've not got a kettle in here. See when you're getting out, could you give us your kettle? And I'm like, ah, not a problem, mate. I'll give you my kettle. So the night before I was due to go to court, I went in the toilet with my kettle and took a big massive dump in it. It was huge and it was smelling. Anybody that's ever been in a prison cell, it's like six by eight feet. Very small. So even with the lid closed over on this kettle, the smell was atrocious. Even I was like that. Oh my God, that is so bad. So I had to cover the kettle with a bag overnight just so we could stomach the smell. So the next day, and probably most of you do this, they come around with the breakfast trolley. But if you're going to court, they'll come a wee bit earlier just to wake you up, get you ready for court. So 
you're right out the hall, there's no waiting about on you. So they came and got us up. And I remember before the breakfast trolley came around, and when the breakfast trolley comes, that usually wakes people up. So it's about half six, seven in the morning, maybe. I remember my friend, he had gotten up early and banged the wall and said, mate, remember and give me that kettle. So he's like, I'm, I'm choking for a cup of tea. And I'm like, ah, mate, the kettle's here. The kettle's coming. So <laughs> when I've been open for court, uh, I've asked, listen, can I give this kettle in the next door? Like, Auntie Border, the screws open the door. And the two of them are sitting, the two of them are up. The two guys in the cell and they're like, ah, cheers, mate. And I've given them the kettle. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> and as they've shut the door, I've like, almost skipped along to the desk to head down to court. Before I got to the desk, all I heard was <laughs> one of them just started kicking the door, screaming, yeah, smell it. <laughs> Gone nuts, yeah. Man, I would like to say the words that they were calling me, but uh, I'll not for the purposes of YouTube. But they were calling me every name under the sun, as we like to say. So I was howling, laughing. Uh, then I left, I went to court. That's the day I went to trial, and I got found guilty at trial. But I had been sentenced to community service and probation, so thankfully I was released and I didn't have to go back. But what I found out, right. See the guy I was sharing the cell with? He went to court the same day as me. So in Scotland, when you're on an indictment charge, as a petition, it's like a more serious charge. They have a thing where if you first get refused bail, you get what's called an eight-day lie-down. So you get remanded for eight days, you go back to court, and if you don't get bail at the second appearance, you'll get a fully committal. So he was up to see if he was getting bail or getting a fully committal. He'd done an eight-day lie-down. He get refused bail. So bearing in mind this guy is having a hellish time being sealed up with me. He's in prison. He's getting his mattress set in fire. He's got a Scottish guy that's frying his nut. He's been refused bail and sent back for the 140 days remand. And when he's came back, the kettle had been returned to the cell and the screws had found out about it and they forced him to clean the kettle and put him on report. Uh, so I've got bad karma for that one. Oh, 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 oh. So you've um you give the you know the backstories to what led up to the attempted murder. You were drunk at the time, and you you, you know you, you know you're going into prison on this sentence for the attempted murder case. You've sobered up by now, I assume. What's going through your head, and what's it like? To, you know when you you're going back in there on that first day. So the funny thing is, right, see when I first went, the first night I went into Pullman for the attempted murder charge, I get put in Blair House. And the first person that came to my door and opened the hatch was one of the guys who was in the cell that I'd given the kettle into. So he's the guy that was padded up my friend. So it literally, I came back, he was in for a murder. He was on remand for the murder and he, he just pointed to me. He's like, I see you, mate, with that kettle. He pulled me up right away. I was like, my God, man. So immediately I got a bit of poetic justice there. But uh, <laughs> as, at first I was kind of, as I say, when I done the first remand, it was a laugh. It was not too serious. I was in and out with this. It was a much more serious charge, a much more serious set of affairs. I was like, ah, right. And every time I've been to prison, I've always said this. I've said, I'm never doing this again. When I done my first night in the cells, when I done my first weekend, or when I done my first remand, every time I'm never doing this again. And see the words, they always come back and haunt me every time I do it again. Because I remember sitting in that cell, like, I can't believe I'm back here. So at, at first, you're kind of. It's a whirlwind almost. You're just kind of like, right, there's that many things going on. Yeah, kind of, you struggle to kind of, I don't know, not accept the circumstances, but I wasn't really thinking about court and all these things. I think everybody thinks when you're in there at first, the first thing you think of, when can I get out of here? I need out, and I need out yesterday. So, at C, with any kind of sentence, it takes a couple of weeks before you establish a routine. And you know yourself, Sean, see, when you get your routine, that's when you can really settle in. Because at first, 
depending what jail you go to, every jail's got different routines, different gym times, different things in the hall, all that kind of stuff. Once you establish the kind of jail routine, you can fit that into like your day. You've got the gym in the morning, maybe exercise, maybe go to education. You get your canteen on a Thursday or whatever. You might have a visit on a Friday. You've got use the phone at this time. So once you establish that, that's when you can really settle in and just get comfortable. So the first couple of weeks is just all about trying to establish a routine. So when I went in there, it was all kind of young guys, young like-minded guys. And I was just in my head, right, how can I get away with this? How can I get out of here? So in Blair House, that was an under-18 hall. So that was chaos because it was all young guys in prison, full of bravado, full of testosterone and fighting was a constant thing. I remember I had an argument with a guy. I had been playing pool or I was playing, he was playing pool and I was playing. So in the hall, they had an Xbox 360. So they only had that available at recreation. So at recreation, you could go and play FIFA. So I'd played someday at FIFA and I'd get beat. And honest to God, I have got serious, serious anger issues when it comes to FIFA. Especially when I get beat. When I get win, I'm fine. When I get beat, it's a different kind of rage. So I get beat and I was really furious with it. I was really annoyed. And I remember walking up to the pool table and I said something like, I'm going to end up smashing that Xbox up. And somebody was like, ah, if you smash that, I'll smash you. <laughs> and I went like, who are you talking to? And then it, it, the guy started walking away and he said something like, uh, I'll shut up or I'll hit you with an iron. I'll hit you with an iron. And I was like, ah, moan then. So I've started marching up to him and the guy, there's been an iron lying just at the side of the hall. And he's picked up the iron, so he's held it like the plug. The wire, the plug's here and the wire's there. So he's got it like a whip. And it ended up a bit of a standoff. So I'm like that, because I, I was preparing for him to swing the iron and I could punch him. And uh, I was, it ended up a bit of a standoff. And I've got one hand up preparing for this iron coming like a malice. He's sitting with the iron. Screws end up running up and splitting it up and dubbing us up. It was the worst thing ever. So I get put in a 10-day all-round. Is what A 10-day all-round was... You didn't get recreation. You got reduced money in your canteen. Just basically being like being grounded. So I remember saying, I'm not doing this again. <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later, uh, I had there was a guy up the stair, right? So back obviously with the gang fight and stuff going on outside, he was for the rival scheme. So when I went in there, there was something going on outside and I basically says he's going to get it when I see him. So we'd been arguing at the windows. He was up the stairs, I was down the stairs, down the stairs and Blair House was kind of segregated and that way the levels were the bottom floor was separate for the second and third. So I had no real way of actually seeing him unless by chance. So one day I was going to court and I remember walking out and uh, they had gathered us all at the bottom of the stairs other people that were taking the court and I remember seeing this guy and I was like right that way I seen him but I kind of I don't think he's seen me right away so we've walked down the route and I was planning in my head I'm like right this is my opportunity as I'm going to batter him so uh, we've gotten to the reception and as we've stepped in I've kind of stood at the side of the door and as he's walked in I've flung a punch at him and we started fighting. I'm punching him in that, and he's ended up into a wall and fell, and I've been punching into him. And the next thing, one of the screws has just rugby tackled me, and that way, he's came into me, and the wall's here, so I've smashed my head off the wall, restrained us, separated us in that, and then I, from then, we get taken down to court, putting in separate cells. So when I came back from court, I was on the port. So the governor... When he seen me the first occasion, he said, listen, if I see you again, you'll be going to the digger, which is segregation. That's what they call it in Scotland. They call it the digger. So this was my second occasion seeing the governor. So he says, right, I'm going to stick by my word, three days in the digger. So I get sent down to the, the segregation block. And that was another thing. I'm like, right. It was like going to Pullman again. I was like, right, I've heard of this. What is this like? 
I remember going down. And I just imagined that, right, three days in the digger is just going to be similar to three days in the police station. So I went down and I just remember it's this much more condensed block. The screws were they're a lot worse than there because they can get away with a lot more. So I felt the threat of violence was always present with them. I remember getting put in the cell. The cell was smelling. There was a, there was a bed. There was like this silver metal tray sticking out of the wall with another silver metal tray underneath it, acting as a table and a chair. There was a sink, and there was a metal sink and a metal toilet. And I just remember, right, just, like, right, that's me here now. So I remember sitting in there, and I, as I say, I was always a keen reader. So they had, like, a wee a mini library in the SEG unit that you could select from, but you had to hit the intercom to ask one of the, the screws to open the door and ha let you have a look. So I'm not really good with multiple choice when it comes to, see, like, things in a menu, anything like that. See, when I've got a full book case of books, I struggle to make a selection. So I remember looking at this selection, and the guy kind of rushed me. So I ended up just grabbing a book and going back. And I went back to the cell, and I was reading the book, and I just couldn't get into it. I was like, this book is crap man so i get back up and hit the intercom and i was like mate this book's garbage man let's pick an our book yeah? and the guys came in again and he's like ah, if you've picked that intercom again we're going to come in here and batter you and he's like ah, you're reading that book whether you like it or no and shut the door i was like ah, are you right man and i was like this is what it's like in here so i ended up in there end up talking to a guy next door to me and that was the thing it was like you had to find somebody down there to talk to it was like, because you were there, you weren't talking to anybody, you were talking to yourself. So, don't get me wrong, uh, the three days in there wasn't too bad. It wasn't as bad as a police station, but you could get a shower. I refused to shower down there. I just went, nah, nah I, I don't want to use your shower. It's probably boring. But I done the three days down there and I went back to the hall. And when I got back to the hall, my telly was broke. I'm like, this is not happening, man. So... End up getting back to the hall. Then after that, I was kind of like, ah, right. No, I mean that's me. I'm, I, I'm no, I'm no getting back there. So thankfully, I never had to go back to the digger. <laughs> I'm loving, I'm loving these long stories, Five O. You tell them very well. Thank you. You, you actually kind of preempted one of my questions, which was, you got these schemes in Glasgow, and there's gangs from each area fighting. Does that then transfer over into the prison system in Glasgow? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. See, nowadays, probably not as much these days because although there still is like a gang violence problem in Glasgow and probably Scotland, but it's not as bad as it was 10, 20 years ago. 10, 20 years ago, it was mental. There's people in jail right now for like a gang violence killing they done 10, 15 years ago and they're paying for it with their life. I remember... Sometimes it would depend, let's say, see, the two guys I talk about, I had instances with, I'm actually friends with them now, but at the time, you're young, it's that thing, and it's that way, the way I seen it, it wasn't because, for the second occasion with the guy, it was the gang thing, it wasn't so much I had a problem with him, it was more so I wanted to inflict damage or do something to him so I could impress the gang outside. It was that way. It was weird. It was, goes back to that kind of social acceptance thing. But you find it quite a lot, especially in the younger hall. It depends. See when people are doing longer sentences, because see when I get my four and a half years and I went up to the other hall, there's a lot less of that kind of stuff because you're kind of right. You've got parole on the horizon. You've got a lot of privileges. You're, it's your home, essentially. Well, if I look back to when I done the seventeen day demand, you're much more susceptible to doing stuff and no thinking about the consequences because unless you really injure somebody or slash somebody or stab them, it's not really going to affect you in prison. But if you're doing three, four years and you've got an issue like that, like people get put in enemy enemy list. So if you fight with somebody you can get put in the enemy list, so that can affect you for visits. If you're on the same landing, it can affect you for the gym. It can affect your time really detrimentally. So 
at that point, there was still occasions, but it just it all kind of depended on people's sentences. And you would find, I remember one guy, he was constantly fighting with people from his area, but his, because the crime he was in for, he had murdered somebody's dad, or that was the crime he was in for. So all this, this the, the friends of the guy whose dad got murdered, they were all gunning for this guy, and they were from an area in, in Mary Hill. So Mary Hill is quite, you've probably heard of it, it's quite uh, a high crime rate in this area. So there's a lot of people from that area in this jail. So that was probably what I seen like the the gang of violence thing kind of occurring most is because of the crimes attached to it rather than just the individual like, gang violence, if that makes sense. It does. And were you too young to be reflecting on the crime you committed almost killing that guy? Or did it bother you that you'd done that? To be honest, man, I felt hard done by. As I say, I, I attached myself to this story of how I disarmed him with a knife to a point I actually started to believe it and started to think this is a joke. But when you're in that environment, you're kind of, your thinking patterns mirrors the thinking patterns of the people around you. There's not many reflective people, remorseful people that are open about it in prison. Most people are, oh, I get caught this time. Oh, he stuck his in. Because usually the victim is the, of the crime is the one in the wrong in your eyes because they stuck you in. Know that you stabbed them repeatedly and nearly killed them, nearly ended their life. It's because they spoke to the police and did a statement against you. So at that point in time, I felt no remorse. I felt more for remorse for myself, as in I wish I never done that because I wouldn't be in prison. But at that point, as I say, it's like when you're at that age, prison is a hotbed of violence. There's people that are in for mad crimes and it's like, the crime doesn't define the person in prison. You'll probably realise that yourself, Sean. It's like you'll meet people that are in for like savage acts of violence, murders, stabbings, attempted murders. But when you're speaking to them, you don't look at them as a killer or attempted killer or a drug dealer. You just see them as a person. You just see them as a person. It's just you get to know them. You coexist. So when you're in the, the prison, you're surrounded by the purveyors of the crime. You're not surrounded by victims of crime. Or if they have been a victim of a crime, like somebody that's been slashed. Ah, he's been slashed. He got done half him. He's had after. It seemed like if you're the victim, you're the, the kind of the lesser one on the scale. But it didn't take for me to years later for me to kind of reflect on that and actually accept, wait a minute, I was in the wrong. Because as I say, my girlfriend at the time had played a part in instigating it. She's not responsible for it, but she did play a role. So I kind of attached myself to, well, I wouldn't have done that if she never said this. And, well, if he never punched me, I might not have done this. So it was all like... Well, if you never made your move, I wouldn't have had to have made my move. So just that way, you try and justify it to yourself. And at that point, I was willing to believe the justification. All right. So did any really high-profile prisoners come in while you were in? So high-profile, in a sense, there was one guy. It wasn't nationwide high-profile, but at the time, it was in Scotland. The guy's name was Craig Roy. I don't you you probably not heard him. He was quite it was in the paper. So basically, this guy, he was a homosexual and he'd been in a relationship with this boy. And I don't know what happened in the relationship, if the boy was cheating on him or if he was cheating on the boy, there was something going on. And Craig Roy, I think he was about 19. It was from his school bride. And what he'd done is he asked the guy to come and meet him in like this secluded wooded area and the guys came out to meet him and he stabbed him to death he stabbed him about 19 times and uh, the guy died he got released in bail for it but when he went to court he was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 19 years I think it was so as I say I was in Iona 3 this was the long term haul we'd been kind of briefed he was coming up so they came, the, the, I kind of got on with the staff in the hall at that point, and they were like, ah, right, going to keep an eye out for him because he may become a target. 
So he was getting put in the cell next to mine. He was getting put in a single cell right away because obviously they maybe feared if he had a co-pilot, they might get a bit too friendly. So I remember this guy came into the hall and he stood out like a sore thumb. He had glasses, he had like the wavy hair. He was very small and he was very like feminine in the way he walked. It was very noticeable what his sexual orientation was by looking at his posture and just how he carried himself, which is fair enough. But when you're used to an environment, a uh, testosterone-filled macho guys, and you see somebody like this coming in, they, they kind of stick out. So when they came in, it's like one of the screws were like that. They called me Big 50. My nickname's 50, so that's what they used to call me. And uh, like they basically says, Big 50, he'll look out for you. And I'm six fit, quite muscular. So I think this boy took an attraction to me. It was like every time you see me a big smile on it. And I was like right back half, mate. No, I mean I'm kinda I'll make sure you're alright, but no, I mean I I don't need to make sure you're that alright. But he ended up settling in. See that way. In some circumstances, you might think somebody like that might get targeted, but there's people that end up when you look at if they were to be targeted, it'd be like a kind of, it'd be bullying, it'd be bullying, and there was, wasn't there many, very many bullies in that hall, bullies, like, I see it quite a lot in English jails that goes on, in Scotland, for what I remember, people like that, they don't last long, people don't respect it, people don't like it, so we kind of settled in the guy, but, uh, so I get moved to another hall, I went to a top end tall, so a top end's kind of like an open hall, so I eventually moved away, but I found out, word trickled in the grapevine, that uh, this guy, right, this guy Craig Roy, he'd been opened up. For whatever reason, I think he was cleaning out his cell or something. And two of the guys that worked on the pass, so I don't know if this is what they call it in England, so when you're in jail in Scotland, they've got the pass, so the pass men. So it's basically a job working in the hall, you're cleaning the hall, you're serving out the food. With this job, it entails your door is unlocked all day, that's one of the perks of the job. So, Craig Roy has been opened to do, like, they call it a slop out in Scotland, it's basically mopping your floor, and uh, it's turned out that two of these past men is, have ended up in his cell, and uh, they've ended up getting some <laughs> they end up getting a blow off the guy, so the, the screws took it really seriously, they moved Craig Roy out of the hall, got intelligence in and there was a big investigation but they actually see this is a thing as well his sister his sister started writing to guys in the hall like to anybody that would speak to her no because like, so they would look after her brother so his sister was essentially like sending photos of herself not really sexually explicit or that but to a point it was like she was literally writing to guys just in the hope that not asking but she, they would look after her brother, but talking to them in that sense where if she was talking to them, they might look after her brother. But I, it was a, the reason why that sticks out to me is because he was just so different to the people you meet. It was just a weird, weird, weird circumstance that like this guy is. And looking at him, you're thinking, this guy murdered somebody. It was bizarre. It was bizarre. So what was the, what was the craziest stuff that either happened to you in jail or that you saw in jail? Well, at one point, so I basically, so, right, I went into this hall, it was called Mineral 3, it was a top-end hall, and when you get moved over that hall, when you're doing like a long-term sentence, you can start going through a process called like preparation for release, so this would start off by what's called SELs. So that's special escorted leave where the reliance, so see basically like the, the screws that would take people, prisoners for court to prison as such. The guys that drive the white vans that put you in there. Well, I think it's G4S now, but back then it was called Reliance. They would escort you to your house for like a two-hour visit. You would be uncuffed. It'd be a lot more relaxed and you would get to spend time with your family. That was just for like a couple of hours, then you get back to prison. So that was the first stage of that process. You would do a couple of SELs and then you could get what's called an outside work placement. So where you would leave the jail every day to go to 
some place to work outside the prison every day, then you would come back. Then eventually you progress to home leaves where you'd spend a couple of days, maybe a week at home. So I had got myself on these SELs, done a couple, and uh, I eventually got a job at the Falkirk Football Stadium. So it was like a maintenance job. So you would go out and basically, they would have wee jobs for you to do, like maintain the grounds or move something. If you're looking for a gift, my new book, Sit Downs with Gangsters, is available worldwide on Amazon. We've interviewed over a thousand people now and we selected 10 of the hardest hitting stories to go in this book. Each chapter features the story of one of our podcast guests. Those stories are Shane Taylor, Knife Maniac's Redemption, John Elite, Mafia Hitman for the Gambino Crime Family, Joey Barnett, 35 years in UK prison, Ian Blink McDonald, £6 million bank robber, Chet Sandu, Asian smuggler in Spanish Supermax, John Lawson, the hit team commander, David Macmillan, international smuggler's Thai death row prison escape, John Abbott, San Quentin prison shootout and escape, Michael Francis, Colombo crime family capo portrayed in Goodfellas. And Wildman, English enforcer in Arizona prison. Link in description box on YouTube, available worldwide on Amazon. Also, my next book, Untouchable Jimmy Savile, is getting published in December 2023. So check that out as well. It will be available worldwide on Amazon. Thank you for listening. Cheers about kind of like an operative's role like a caretaker or a janitor or something so i remember i was a few days into this job and i was seriously bored i was like right i'm outside of jail but i can't really do anything so i managed to acquire a phone and uh for that point i was kind of like right i'm out here to do something and Let's just say I had visits for a lot of people. I became quite popular at this place that I'm talking about. So as I was getting back to the jail, a lot more people wanted to become acquainted with me. Mm -hmm. So uh, at one point I was taking stuff back to the jail and uh, I started using steroids. So as I say, I've always been quite a obsessive, addictive personality kind of guy. So... I've been, I managed to get, a, it was called D-Balls, so they're like 10 milligram tablets. I think I acquired a couple hundred of them. And at that point, I was just gubbing like 15 at a time. So like 10 milligram, I want to be massive, I want to be swole. But I would take like 15 and I would go and take a dump and I would immediately think, I've dumped them back out, I'll need to take another 15. So I'm taking about 30 in the winter. Eventually, it was around about the time, the whooping cough, was in uh, the newspaper, so that was like this, it was almost like the COVID of like 10 years ago, like where this dangerous viral cough is coming and it's taking over and everybody's going to die, all that fear mongering stuff. I developed a cough and it was like, I, call it like, <gasps> like, I would cough and I would feel like I was going to be sick. So it was off the back of these steroids, I think. And uh, I would go back to the prison and I remember they tried to detain me in the prison because they thought I'd brought this whooping cough back. Went to the doctors and it was all good, it was fine. He's like, ah, listen, you've no got it, see you later. And I got back out. But as I say, I was bringing stuff back and the heat started kind of descend upon me. I remember at one point I was, I go back to that thing doing outlandish stuff. I remember, so you had to, secrete these items about your person so to speak so in this process i'd learned how to stick stuff up my ass so <laughs> at one point i was trying to just do as much as i could in the one in the water so i could get it done i remember i stuck four and a half ounce of dope up my ass solid and i was walking like a cowboy i could i couldn't walk i had to take an ounce back out and I was going back, and I, I was a big consumer of a lot of protein. So as I say, my, my dumps, they used to stink. So I would take like steroids back for people and that. And people would, it would be this unmistakable smell of crap. Like, fecal matter. Like, you couldn't get rid of it. 
I remember there was complaints for oil the prison about the smell of the stuff people were getting back. They were complaining like that. Why is it? They were smoking, the smoke stank here. I remember a guy, right? He had to take one of these tablets, these roids, right? And he would take one tablet and he would get a pro a protein shaker and he would fill it with water and he would drop the tablet in the water, then tank it. Just that's how bad it tasted because of the smell. So eventually there was certain things I says I'll not bring back. Like blues. So that's a uh, I don't know what you call them. So Valium basically, if I can say that. So that was a thing which was a problem. Because see, when people take that in prison, they just don't care. They just become reckless, chaotic. They're fighting. The thing we hits the fan, so to speak. So I remember I brought some back for a guy. And the hall just ended up mental. People were fighting. People were arguing with screws. The screws were in the daft. They knew something was going on. And people were just being so stupid about it. Like, people were on jail phones talking about who they were getting to do this for them and all that. And so, eventually, I remember one day, I came out to the stadium. And I walked into the office. And there was two screws for the jail there. And they were looking at me. And I was like, ah, right, what's happening here? And they says, we're here to search your locker. And I was like, I don't use a locker. So the guy, so see when I had worked this job, the guy from the prison, the con, that worked in the job before me, he'd been busted. He kept like, all sorts of steroids in a locker that he was using. But it turns out he'd been using the same locker as the manager of the football stadium. So this guy came in, found it, and phoned the jail and stuck him in. So they had this thing where we used to keep a thing in a locker. I didn't use a locker, so I'm like, ah, what are they going to find in here? They opened this locker and found nothing. And they were kind of like, ah, right. They bought it and gave me that kind of nod. See that nod the police give you when they've not just caught you, but they'll catch you again. Mm -hmm. That kind of way, like, ah, you got away with it this time. Mm -hmm. So they left and I was like, ah, what is going on here? So... I had been out of this work placement about five weeks and then eventually they they came down to see me in the gym in prison. They called me into a meeting and just says, right, you're after this. And there's been allegations, there's intelligence that you're uh, bringing substances into the hall and supplying people with them. So obviously I denied it. I was blown in the face. I was like, nah, no me. And uh, they took us off it. But I remained in the top end hall so, naturally, with me being innocent of these horrific charges libeled against me by the Scottish Prison Service, I thought, well, an innocent man will protest his innocence. So I started complaint procedures, writing to ombudsmen, writing to lawyers. I'm getting back out there. Trust me on that. So I had stuck up an acquaintance with a female Always females, these stories, they always end some way, impressing people and females, man. That's my poison. So I admit she'd worked behind the bar at the stadium and obviously I had been in prison for about two and a half years. So I was that way again. I was chasing after her, man, like a bad smell. But she was into it, you know what I mean? It's, uh, I didn't sleep well, didn't get a chance to, but we'd become acquainted. So I'd gotten her number. So I had been phoning her from prison after I'd been taken off uh, this work placement. And I remember saying to her once, she was quite small. And I said something ridiculous. She was doing all sorts on the phone. She was playing with herself, doing stuff like that. But I don't know why I'd done it. I thought I was maybe being funny. I'd, I just, as I say, I was an idiot back then. So I said to her something about having a stash. And I said, you probably wouldn't reach my stash. And then like two days later, I get called into a meeting. It was intelligence. They had a bag pack. And from this bag pack, they pulled out a mobile phone, a big roll of cling film, and a tub of Vaseline. And <laughs> and they says, right, we checked the changing rooms and we opened up one of the ceiling tiles and found this. Can't explain it. And I was like, I'd never seen that before. Like, and then they basically told me they'd been listening to every single phone call I'd been making 
and they gave me that look like every phone call. So they ended up, they went, this was in the last six months of my sentence. And he says, right, we're taking you at the top end to all you're going back into like mainstream. And uh, the police will be in touch. So I'd been in two and a half years, nearly three years at this point. I phoned the lassie, the girl from the work placement. And she was like, ah, right, the police have just been away from my door. Like, the CID. So I'm like, ah, what? I'm going to get another sentence here. And if they've been in that length of time, I was like, ah, no way. So the last six of my month was just filled with pure anxiety. Like, because they do a thing in Scotland called a gate arrest. They probably do it in England where you can do your full sentence, get to the gate and the police turn up to charge you with something else and you just get, you don't get it. So I remember the day I was getting out. i have been in three or two months and I was just like, right. It was almost waiting for the clown to jump out of the cake. That kind of feeling like, that, right, they're just going to pop out of somewhere and just say, nah, you're not getting out. So I went down to the reception and I was placed in the room with two other guys getting out. And I just remember one of the, the screws opening the door and going like that, right, Jordan, me or whatever word with you. And I'm like, ah, here we go, here it's here. And they took us in the room and they sat down with this wee questionnaire and I was like, right, what's this about? And they says, no, it's just natural. We just, we ask people how they go on their sentence and that kind of thing. We do it with everybody. I was like, ah, right. So they're just asking us, right, how did you go on your sentence? How did you find it? This and that. And then just fairly innocent questions. And then the woman screw, her name is Alison, I remember. And she put the pen down and she went like, right, who was bringing in the roids? And I went like, don't know what you're talking about. And like, listen, I went on the holiday for two weeks and I came back and you doubled in size. And so I was like, listen, I don't know. And see that way, I just kind of resigned to it. I was like, that's me. I'm not getting out of here. And I just kind of went, resigned to it. And then she, she went, okay, put us back in the cell. Uh, put us back in, like, it was like a holding cell. It wasn't really a cell, it was in the reception. So I get put back in there. And uh, they went like, right, that's yours. And took us out to the gate. And I remember the gate opening up. And I just looked, looked at the guy, the screw, and I just went, can I go? And he went, aye, you're out. And I just walked out. And I just remember that it was March, March 2013, 18th of March. And the cold wind hit me, and it was just like, I'm up. It was that way, all that anxiety and that had dissipated, man. But uh, it, was, it was a mad time. It was a mad experience. Did you have a plan for when you got out? No, nah, no, I thought, get full of roids. <laughs> that was my only plan. Uh, so I had always envisaged, I don't know, I, I think I speak for everybody that's ever done a sentence. For me, every day that sentence was spent thinking about the day I get out. Every day, there's not a day it went by I didn't think about getting out. I'd always planned the day I got out, I would walk down to my pal's house and I would get him. But I didn't have much plans of, I wasn't going to take over Glasgow. I wasn't, didn't have any good plans in place. I just, as I say, I was up to that point. I feel as if I would just go out and wing it for there. So when I got out, my plan was to get massive, to like get full of roids and get huge. And I'd done that. I done that, but I went into that pattern of right. I want to celebrate. I've been in the jail for seventeen to twenty. I've got a lot of time to make up for, and when I say time to make up for, I mean time drinking and going out. So I would go out and have a drink at the weekend, socialise, but I didn't really experiment with substances or that. It just wasn't really my thing at the time. I was more into the gym, but eventually, when you're there's a phrase people use, if you hang about the barbers long enough, you'll eventually get a haircut. Mm. So when you're hanging about with people that are all using this and that, you eventually start doing it as well. So I started taking white uh, when I was drinking. At first, as I say, I would do it. Next day, wake up, nose all burned. Like that. Never doing that again. Obviously, with that phrase, you know where this leads. So I would start doing it. I remember... It was weird. I don't remember when it shifted. At one point, I would occasionally take it when drinking. Then the next minute, I couldn't drink without taking it. Mm. So it started off like that. I would be like a night out. And then nights turned into two nights, then three nights. Then before you know it, it was Friday to Monday, full benders, no sleep. The gym, and I still just stopped going to the gym. I lost a lot of weight. 
I was just I live in for the weekend, but my weekends were becoming weeks. Uh, couldn't hold down a job, had no stability in life, was just drifting through life. And that, occasionally I would maybe get like, some agency work, I'd get a couple of days work here and there, I'd get a wage, maybe get two wages, then I would end up in a bender, miss work, lose the job or lose the agency work. If I did get money, it would be going on debts. I believe myself like, with £20 to eat for the week, the rest would be going on whatever I could get off people. And that was my life for a good period until roughly it was about 2014, no, 2015 it was. 2015, roughly about October or something. I had been on a bit of a, they call it a mad one in Scotland, basically like a, a session, like a, a binge. And I was up a set of high-rise flats. I was at a friend's house, and this was one of the houses, like, when you went into it on the Friday, the door gets shut, and you didn't leave it till, like, Monday. Just one of the, just a den. It wasn't a house, it was a den. It was a dungeon. They called it, it was a place called Dumbreck. They called it the Dumbreck Dungeon. So I ended up there one night. And it was just a standard night. The place was full of people. I ended up crashing out, which was very odd and peculiar because usually I was up straight through but I'd crashed out Saturday night I woke up on the Sunday morning it was about 8, 9 o'clock in the morning and I got up and the party was in still full swing so I got up and I was like right here we go, Sunday sesh that's what they call it in Scotland, like a Sunday session when you're drinking so I got up, I remember pouring myself a vodka like a half fill in the glass filling up with coke and that was me right back on it and suddenly, this was like five minutes after waking up, I heard a banging at the door. Well, it turns out it was the police. So the police have turned up to the door. They're wanting the entry. They're like, let open the door. And we're all like, bolt, get to, you're not getting in. So suddenly the police have started trying to kick the door in. So we've all just barricaded ourselves against this door, like a human shield. People are holding the top of the door, people holding the bottom, people get their backs against the door. Naturally, I'm there. I'm like, I'm getting, getting this door shut. The police are trying to kick the door in. And I remember becoming affronted, like, who do they think they are? Who are they to try and spoil your Sunday sesh, be coming up and kicking the door in? So eventually, my pal, he's the guy whose house it was, he's opened the door. And I was first out the door. I jumped out and I was like, you just get to it. And I, I didn't even finish my sentence. I'd come flying out the door with my hand in their face. They just grabbed my arm and pulled me to the ground. Two police wrestled me to the ground. And I'm resisting. I'm like, get off me, you know what? Shouting and bawling at them. And uh, eventually they've radioed for backup. And I swear to God, see, within about a minute, two minutes, there was a small corridor. It's called like a landing. They maybe call it the close in Scotland. That is just filled with police officers. I swear to God, there was about 30. They've came in, they've stormed in the house. More of them have restrained me. They've tied leg restraints around my legs. It's like they velcro restraints. And uh, eventually, it's just been two lines of police down this corridor. So they picked me up, escorted me out to the van. I'm giving them abuse. I'm still quite drunk, giving them verbal abuse and that. They've put me in the van, they've taken me away to the police station. So I I was working, I had a job at that point in time, so I was due to be working the next day. So in my head, I was thinking, I'll be at work tomorrow. No, I mean, I, I, I didn't take it very seriously. So when I got to the police station, they said, you're charged with police assault, and I'm shouting, I invoke my right to remain silent. This is, this is a disgrace and all that. And uh, giving them pure abuse, I get put in the cell and... Uh, eventually fell asleep and I get woken up by a, a, they call it CID so it's basically the police in suits so they wanted to take my clothes off me and I was like I was kind of surprised I was like why do you want my clothes and I says you're not getting them I was like listen give your clothes so eventually I'm like no what take them flung my clothes at them and uh, they've given me the grey jogging tracksuit and the pair of sand shoes but they've given me that. But I was under the impression I was getting out the next day. I was leaving the police station in the Monday. Mondays came around, my doors got opened, and I'm like, All right, see you later. And I've walked round to the desk, and when I got to the desk, there was a G4S with a handcuff 
ready to cuff me and take me to court. I'm like, you're joking, am I going to court? And they say, die. So that was me off again. Right, let's just go to court. La, la, la. I started shouting and bawling. So I get put in the bus and taken to court. And whilst I was in the court cells, I bumped into a guy that was in the flat with me the night before. So I was like, we get put in the cell together. And I was like, right, what are you doing here? So what had transpired was, when I'd been arrested and taken for the flat, they'd arrested me, cuffed me, restrained me, and taken me away down the stairs. But when the police have ran in that flat, they've ran down the stairs, and one of the guys has had an axe in one hand and an iron in the other. And at the last minute, he's ditched the axe under a couch. The police has ran in, and he's attacked one of the police officers with the iron. Burst the guy's face open. Then he's ran in a bedroom, shut the door, thrown the iron off the balcony. Bear in mind, this is 11 floors up. Pulled his trousers down and starfished the bed as if to pretend he's sleeping. So the police have ran in, arrested him, tied him up the exact same. So when they went to retrieve the iron, they found two and a half ounces of white that someone had thrown out of the adjacent kitchen window. So when I got to court, there was four of us there from the house. So I was kind of like, ah, you have had it. Because the way I'd seen it, I was done with something completely different. I wasn't anything to do with them. So I felt I was like, you are going to get shafted for this. So eventually, they've came around with our court papers and we were all co-accused. We were all on an indictment charge. So the charge I was done with was called like a Police and Fire Reform Act. It's essentially a breach of the peace. Naturally, that would be on a summary case. So a summary in Scotland is a case that carries no more than a maximum of 12 months custodial. Lowest rung in the ladder, you can get community service, you can get a fine. It's for not so serious charges. Whereas an indictment can carry up to five years and it could even go to the High Court. So we were all in petition and indictment. So I was like, wait a minute here, what's going on? So we get taken into the petition court. It's like a closed court. And uh, I, I was still out in license from my uh, attempted murder charge. I still had, I think it was 11 months of my license left. My lawyer came and seen me and he was like, it's not looking good. So the guy who was charged with the assault and the police officer, it was a serious assault. He went into court and got bail. So he came out and he's like, I get bail. I'm like, ah, right. Result. So the next guy went in, who was done with the white, he got bail as well. So me and another guy, we were only, and we were in for the same charge, Police and Fire Reform Act. Essentially, the, the lowest charges on the petition, we're rubbing our hands, like, ah, right, we're getting it. So he's went into court first. He's came back out, like, I've been remanded. And then it was just the writing was in the wall for me. I'm like, ah, right, I'm getting remanded then, if he is. Went in, remanded. So I was 24 at the time, and uh, so rather than go to Pullman, this is when I went to Berlin. First time been to Berlin, and I was just like, no, I can't believe I'm going back here, man, going back to the jail. And if I thought Pullman was bad, Berlin is one infinity times worse. Honest, it was like going back to the Stone Ages, man. I had only heard of Berlin, read about it. It's infamous in Glasgow. Everybody knows Bar L. Berlin, they've heard stories that you've got that kind of idea of it, but when you go there, man, it's like, it's stuck in a time warp. I remember getting there and just getting into the hall, you go into the first night centre. So basically, it's like, it's like an admissions hall. You would go in there for a night, they would decide where to put you and you would go to a hall the next day. So I remember getting to there and it was me and the guy my co-accused we went into the hall and the past men were still serving the food so we managed to get a bit of food a pure horrible watery curry I remember I getting it pure rock hard chips and uh, the guys were saying what are you in for and we says in a house police have came to the door and one's been attacked with an iron and the guy's like no way is that yous that's in the paper went and got the paper full page spread it showed you a photo of the flats with all the police vans outside it, and a photo of an iron, the offending iron. So uh, we realised we were infamous when we got there. So done a night in the first night centre, and that was kind of 
as I say, I'd done three years in Pullman, but when you, it was a different kind of experience, right? Berlin. I always thought Berlin. I thought Pullman was the worst you could go to. I thought every jail was better than Pullman. What a surprise I got. So uh, we get moved to Sea Hall the next day. So Sea Hall's the remand hall in Berlin. And I remember walking into the hall and the minute when I walked in the front doors of the hall, so it's four landings in Berlin, but it's like in Pullman, when there's four landings in a hall, it's like a, there's a ceiling to every landing. So it's like a flat, whereas in Berlin, you can see right up to the top floor for the bottom. It's just got a staircase and it's all we mini landings, if that makes sense. So I remember just being kind of taken aback at the scale of it, how big it was, how many people were kicking about and that. And I, I went up to, I was in the fourth flat. Uh, I met a guy there that was from my area. He was in charge of a murder, so he was on the pass. So it was actually quite handy that he came in. Well, I came in, I say it was handy. It was handy he was there, so he was kind of like, right, kind of gave me a few things in, kind of gave me some extras in the food and that. I remember being in there and suddenly it was the victim complex kicked in again. I shouldn't be here. This is somebody else's crime. All that didn't they take accountability for my actions. So I remember being in there like this is absolutely brutal. It was just the screws run Berlin. Like it's like with the authority, the bullying, the threat of violence is ever apparent. Before in Pullman, you could give some verbal back to the screws. Berlin, you would get you would get a tanking if you done that. The screws are very much in that kind of 90s, 1980s mindset where they, they rule with an iron fist because back then they had to, whereas now it's still it's still ever present, the fear of violence for him. So I went in there and uh, get refused bail for my fully committal. The next day after we get admitted to Sea Hall, my co-accused, he got released because he had been given bail by the judge, but the procurator fiscal had refused bail. So when that happens, the procurator fiscal has like 48 hours to provide evidence to support why they refused your bail, or why they opposed bail, sorry. So they never provided evidence within 48 hours, so he was released. So it was just me, myself, in Berlin. And I was like, ah, no way, I just suddenly felt so alone. I was honestly, we use a phrase in Scotland, it's called scunnered. I was absolutely scunnered, like gutted. So after I'd been refused bail for my fully committal, there's one last ditch attempt you can make it bail, it's called high court bail. So you can, your lawyer can, apply to the High Court for them to review your uh, uh, opposition to bail, and then they can... Uh, that's the last ditch attempt at getting bail. If you get not back there, you're doing the remand. So I remember, I think it was like maybe three weeks into the remand, there was an event on, it's called Tough Talk. They do it in uh, the jails, and I think they do it in Scotland, but I think it's UK, and it's these two English guys, they're like ex-doormen, ex like bodybuilders, but now they'd found God in that and they came into jails and tell guys their story. But one guy tells the story and the other guy does squats, it's mental. <laughs> and uh, they done it in this church, right? And I remember sitting, like, because I'd seen it before in Pullman, they'd done it before. And I remember sitting in one of the screws, it said, Jordan Robertson. Like, Who's that? Who's Jordan Robertson? And I'm like, that's me. And they shouted, is there? And like, uh, you've got bail. And I was like, oh, you're joking. And they're like, you can't swear in a church. And I was like, I'm oh, waiting. And they're like, all right, moan. Because see, when you get high court bail, you're instantly out. No matter where you are, no matter what time it is, you're out. So, like, moan, you're getting bail. So I've been walking out and I just remember turning around and people, <laughs> all the cons were just looking at me. Like, as if you're not getting out. I was just like, see you later. And just walked out. I was pure shock. So I went up to my cell, go all my belongings. Grabbed my noodles and that and gave them to the boy that had been helping me out, the boy Sean. And I remember I had that feeling again, like, right, I'm not getting out here. Because I had been on licence, I thought maybe, are they going to try and recall me at the gate? And I remember saying to the screw, I was like, ah, what's the chances I'll get recalled at this gate? He's like, ah, mate, I would have told you by now. We need to tell you before you get to the gate. So I remember getting out. It was like five o'clock. So this is maybe November. So it's five o'clock, so it was dark. And they let me out the gate, and I remember walking out, and I was just like, yeah, screaming, cheering. 
I went into the reception to see if the screws would phone us a taxi. They wouldn't phone me a taxi. I had to go down to the pay phone at Bolton Street. The post had took my phone. I didn't have a phone, so I had to get the pay phone to phone a taxi. I went home. I was locked out of my house, so I had to go to my pal's house. I'm kicking about with this plastic bag full of my belongings. <laughs> and uh, that was like me, scot free, buzzing. I spoke to my uh, the license officer. So I had to get in touch with her pronto and she's like, ah, right, it's been referred back to the parole board. We'll need to see what happens with it. So in my mind, I'm like, ah, right, I'm innocent. I've not really done, I've not done a pose. I've not been caught with anything. I'll be all right. And uh, I, I, about five weeks later, I was meant to go to a, a license, a license meeting with my license officer. And I'd been working, I think I was working late. I think the office shut at five, but I was working till six. And I says, look, can we reschedule? And she's like, all right, fair enough, we can reschedule. And I went home that night. And uh, whilst I was in the house, it was like nine o'clock at night. And I heard the door chatting. And uh, my heart just sank. I just, right away, I knew. And I looked outside, just seeing a big team of police officers at the door. And I just knew, like, I've been recalled. They opened the door and they're like, oh, listen, now you've been recalled. We're going back to jail. And see, at that moment, that's probably been the most gutted I've been seeing it put in that van and taken back because, like, with a recall, you don't do half. You don't get time off or going home without a fight. 11 months, you're doing 11 months. I remember just sitting, and that's probably one of the lowest points I've ever felt. I'm going back here. There's no way out of this. So that was me right back to Berlin and... That way I had just left Berlin. I realised how hellish it was. And I was like, I can't believe I'm going back here. But see the thing, see, because I had been bailed, that meant all of us, the, the people that were accused in this case, we were all out in bail. So with that, if I had been kept on demand, they would have been forced to have taken me, taken us to court within about four months because they've got like a certain time bar they need to stick to. But because we were all out in bail, that meant they were allowed to wait up until a year before it went to court. So when I get recalled, that meant they could take this full year so I could do this full recall and then get another sentence. So when I went back in, it was a pure pity party for myself because I, I seen it as, well, I've done the least crime, uh, the, uh, the least serious crime on this charge sheet, but I'm the one in prison. No, I just blamed everybody else. It was just the natural part of my thinking I went into. I went into B-Hall this time. And if I thought C-Hall was bad, B-Hall was 10 times worse. But it was just black tiles on the floor. You would wake up and there'd be beetles crawling about the cell and that. It was just pure disgusting. That was the thing with Berlin. It struck me. Pullman, there was a bit more life in Pullman, I felt, because it was all younger guys. Berlin, it's just... it's. 90% of people with drug problems, people that are just time-served criminals that are just in and out, in and out, in and out, and it just, there was a sense of hopelessness. So when I went in there, it's like, I just I had to go on with it, I suppose. I went in and hit the gym in that. I played the guitar, so whilst I was in Pullman, I actually acquired a guitar. I'll show you this here, see this guitar? Can I shut turn that? So, <laughs> basically, you ever heard of Billy Bragg? Yes. So, Billy Bragg done a thing where he donated a host of these guitars. I don't know if it was all the Jews in the UK or the Jews in Scotland, but in Pullman, I acquired one of these guitars. I decided I want to learn the guitar. And it was a guy, the guy was doing a life sentence. He gave me that guitar. He said, look, I'm not going to use it. So he gave me that. And I learned to play on that guitar in Pullman. This was in my last year. And it really helped to pass the time. It was, I just found a love for it. And then I decided, right, if I don't have a guitar outside, I'll probably not play it. I'm probably not going to buy a guitar. So that guitar's coming with me. So I stole that guitar out of Pullman. It wasn't even mine. <laughs> Took it out. So when I went to Berlin, I, I was like, I need my guitar. So... I got that guitar handy then, right? So at this point, I didn't know nothing about, but I didn't even know who Billy Bragg was. I didn't know he donated these. I knew nothing about it, right? So 
I found out there was a screw in Berlin called Alan Dixon and he ran a guitar class. He'd done it off his own back. It wasn't like an official class that we'd go to education. He would just come and get his for the hall and come down and get a jam. Really nice guy. So I remember I managed to get my name done for this class. And I turned up on the first day with that guitar on my back and I just seen his face drop. And he said, where did you get that guitar? And I was like, ah, it's mine. He's like, no, isn't he? He's like, because ah, what had happened was, so Billy Bragg had donated these guitars to the jail. So they'd, he'd also donated them to Berlini. And Alan Dixon, the screw, had these guitars, but he gave them to people and they never returned the guitars. They gave them away. So he thought that somebody in the hall had given me his guitar. So this ended up a standoff within two minutes of me walking out of his class. He's like, ah, geezer, I'm like, ah, you're no getting this guitar. And I was telling myself, if he tries to take this guitar, I'm smashing it off the flare. I refuse <laughs> to give him it. So I end up an argument and I end up saying, I'll fight you for this guitar. And then, but it was kind of, <laughs> it kind of went like that, right? It knows if like, me offering to fight him for the guitar, put him up, it just kind of went, right, chill it. And then kind of, he kind of left it for the time being. So when we go to the jam on, we all sat and jammed with guys, just blah, everybody like plays a tune. So I'd been writing songs. I started writing tunes outside of prison, but when I came in, I started kind of using it as like a opportunity just to write and kind of, I don't know, just a vessel to express emotion in my situation. So he asked me to play my tune and I played him a tune that I'd wrote and his face just lit up. And he's like, just plays another one. And uh, I played him an art tune and he was buzzing. He just really just took a pure shine to me. He said to me afterwards, he's like, usually you've got guys coming in here, you ask them to play your tune and it's all about being in the jail and all depressed and crap. But mine's, yours had a bit of life to it. It was something different, something unique. So suddenly he became very supportive of me because my plan upon release, this time I had a plan. I was going to go and I was going to become... A musician, like I, I had done, I'd performed like gigs previous to this sentence, but I was gonna use this as an opportunity to write music and then get out. And that's what I was gonna do. I had started going to the gym again in this sentence because mine had patched it before it. Patched it basically means to stop doing something or to, to, to ditch something. So I'd patched the gym up to this sentence, then I started going again when I got this recall. But because I decided I was going to be a musician, rock star, singer, songwriter, pop star, I decided that you can't be muscly and be a singer, songwriter. It just doesn't look good. So I stopped going to the gym. I decided I wanted to be like Liam Gallagher and be slim and all that kind of stuff. So I stopped going to the gym just so I could look more like a guy that plays the guitar. Hmm. So I used that experience writing tunes. I get not back for parole. So when you get a recall within about I think it's like the first month or so you can get a, like a parole hearing where you can go up and they can decide, right, if they want to re-release you back on license. So when I got my parole papers, it was listed as I was charged with uh, intent to supply and this this Police and Fire Reform Act. So I was like, I, I thought I was in prison for this. I thought they had added this charge on because they found the way out in the street. So I thought, are they charging lawyers with us? So when that went to the parole hearing, they just went, you're not getting it. The heavy tore is a new one, if I'm being honest, man. Pure went right through us. So that was me, recalled, and I had this thing hanging over me. Again, like, is this going to bite me in the backside? I screw Alan Dixon, he took a real shine to his man. He really encouraged me. He's like, ah, listen, you don't need to be in here doing this stuff. And see, that's a thing a lot of people used to say to me. They'd say, inside the out of jail, people were like that. Ah, in jail, the blah. You don't seem like the kind of guy that that's in jail, and I'm not. It's just a lot of behaviours. I call like if I'm under the influences of substances or alcohol or that. I just I'm very reckless and impulsive and just do wild stuff. So I used that time in that sentence just to kind of try and write a lot of music, and then that was my plan to get out and release all this music. So eventually, my case was called three weeks before I was due to be released. So at this point, I, we're on an indictment. I'm like, ah, how is this going to turn out? Because I could get another sentence and no matter if it was concurrent or consecutive, I'm still doing it on top of how long I've done. So it was 11 months I'd done. And I remember uh, 
I was due to go to court. Let's just say it was a Tuesday. I was meant to go to court, right? The G4S never picked me up from the jail. So I never get taken to uh, the courts. So I phoned my lawyer and he's like, ah, right, there's just been a mistake. You'll be out tomorrow. So say it was the Wednesday, they took me to court. And this was for the, the pleading diet. So when I got there, I just walked in to the dock. My co accused were there. And my lawyer stood up and says, my client, he tenders a plea of not guilty. And the, the fiscal, they said, the Crown accepts the plea of not guilty. And I get taken back down the stair. And I'd remembered, see, when I committed, I was in that fight in Pullman, the gang, for the gang thing. I get charged with an assault for that. And I get taken to Falkirk Sheriff Court. And when I walked into the dock, my, my lawyer, the same lawyer, he said, my client offers a plea of not guilty. And the Crown says, we accept that plea of not guilty. So I knew right away. I was like, he's just got me a not guilty there. So I went back down the stairs and they called me in. And he says, right, so basically I managed to get a plea deal for you. Your co-accused, they pled to the, the white, the possession with intent. The other guy pled to the assault and you and the other co-accused got the charges dropped. But what turns out, see the day before, the day I never get taken to court, it was a different fiscal on the case and they were refusing point blank to drop the charges against me, even with a plea deal. So by luck... By the grace of God that I didn't get taken to court that day because things might have been very different. So immediately that was me. I was like, right, three weeks to go and I'm out. So I got out and uh, I met up with a friend. It was the same friend I met up with when I was released from my long-term sentence in Pullman. And that was my plan to go out, start releasing music, start performing. The first thing I'd done, one of the first things I'd done, we went to the pub to celebrate my release, and uh, he sold white. So I was like, ah, we can grab a bit, I'll celebrate, get us a bit. And he went and grabbed me some, and that was me. Within a couple of hours, hammering it. And that was to signify the beginning of a downfall, as such, because, as I say before, when it was the Friday to Monday benders, it just hit a new level. The white that was kicking about since... I'd been in prison, had it increased in strength and purity, so it was really strong. Everybody was on it. It was it was just pure carnage. It was just mental, just benders and that, just drinking. I managed to acquire a job and I never made a Monday in this job for about four months. It was a charity fundraising job where I would stand in the street and I would ask people to donate money to a charity to help with disadvantaged children, and disabled children. And there was days I'd be turning up and we'd be in the pub, snorting away and that kind of thing. It just, it was becoming a thing where, like me and all my friend group, we were all pretty bad on it. We were using it every day and that. And it was just, times it wasn't even enjoyable, but it was like for me, the guitar, playing the guitar, making music, that got flung out the window. This was my life, this was my existence. And things started just to get to a bit of a downfall. I started selling it, which is a very, very bad idea. It's like an alcoholic buying a pub. <laughs> it was just, I was doing that. It was just, I was running about. I was just doing stupid things. I think I didn't drink one weekend. One weekend I had sober. And uh, I decided, right, that's me. I'm not going to drink anymore. I'll just start making money. And... When I say I used to sell it, I used to, they call it in Scotland, tick. So see if I go and get a quantity of a certain substance, rather than pay for it there and then, you would pay for it, say, next Friday or on a arranged date. So they call that tick. So usually when you're selling, when you start off, you tick a fair amount of substance off some off a higher up dealer you would sell it, pay back your tick and get another bit and take your profit. So I was ticking these uh, larger bits with the intent and the purpose of selling it, but I pretty much snorted it all myself. I would go in benders. I'd be giving it away to people. I'd be like, right, help yourself and that kind of thing. And uh, waking up on the Monday with all this debt and eventually it started off 
someone told me a good idea after you've been on it for like three days on a bender. If you take a couple of Valium, you go to, you go to bed, you wake up and you don't have a hangover. You escape a hangover and I'm like, ah, I've cracked it. So that became a thing. But what started off as like two tablets, three tablets after a session, soon became 15, became 20. Times I was dubbing 50 at one time. And it wasn't just to get asleep. Times I was doing it because I didn't want to wake up. It was just that bad. The way my life was at that time, I was just, I was just going off the rails. As soon as I started taking Valium, it just, it totally changed because I remember the first time I done it, I took 50 in the water and I didn't want to wake up. But I woke up as I was very gutted at the time to feel. And when I woke up, I was what they call it in Scotland, they call it bouncing. That's uh, when you're basically under the influence of Valium. So I didn't like that feeling of being on that downer. So I started taking white during the day to bring me back up to another level. So that's how I was operating on for a period of time. I was doing a lot of stupid stuff. People around me didn't trust me. People stopped speaking to me. I fell out with people. And uh, I, my life just went in this downward spiral. And it was like that for a, a, a fair bit. Then uh, eventually, I was going out. I was shoplifting in that. I was going into like retailer stores, stealing clothes. I was getting into the Morrison supermarket like across from my house. And uh, I was getting in and stealing like, bottles of tequila, just throwing them in my bag. I was just, just doing stuff like that. I uh, I had no structure in my life or nothing. I was constantly, I was in like £5,000 debt to all these various dealers. Some were large amounts like, like grands and some were like £200 here, 50 quids there to everybody. Uh, and I was just going into the shops, stealing stuff. And one day I went in, I was carrying a Stanley blade on me. And the reason why, because I owed out that much money, I felt, well, if I, if somebody owed me that amount of money and seen me in the street, and if I seen them, I'd be quick. It wouldn't be a kind spoken word. That way I felt as if, right, it's either me or them. So I carried this. Uh, I had it in a bag, right? And I eventually got a job working charity fundraising for a homeless charity called Shelter. And it was a Friday. I'd actually gotten paid that day, so I actually got money. Not that much of it was mine, but it was all going out. So I went into the Morrisons that day. I was actually on my way to work. And uh, when I went into work, I went into Morrisons, sorry, I grabbed in my bag two bottles of tequila and a meal deal. And as I was leaving the store, the security tried to stop me. And I just knew it was, in my head, this is a Friday if I get arrested weekender. So I just ran out the store. And I ran in to see the sliding doors. They didn't slide open quick enough for me. So I ran into them. And my head was sticking out, but my shoulders were behind the doors. The security guards grabbed my bag. I've got the bag off me. Then he's grabbed my jacket. Got my jacket off me. And then I've ran away. But what I realised was, see, I had my ID for my job. So it's like a lanyard. You'd wear this ID around your neck. So it was door-to-door -door fundraising. So you had to wear this at all times during the operation of this job. It identifies you as a fundraiser, obviously to protect people from fraud and whatnot, but you can't work without it. So I realised I couldn't go to work without my ID. So I just, I never went back. Then uh, what was in the bag was my ID. There was a sheet with my address on it. Everything attached me to this was stolen items in this Stanley. So eventually the, the police came looking for me. I was staying at my dad's at the time. And I just avoided them. I just I just thought they were putting free, we, uh, the wee cards, we calling cards through the door. I was just binning them. And I, I just ducked and dive for a good period and then eventually I, I changed from uh, the white to the green because I was getting that feeling seeing a Friday I'd be sitting and it would hit like 7 o'clock and it would be like a full moon changing a werewolf that's what it felt like it was like 
the minute the clock striked like late evening on a Friday, I would get this urge, this impulse to go out and drink and take whatever. So to combat that, I started smoking green to take away, and it did take away that urge. But I was just swapping one substance for another, so I eventually managed to regain a bit more stability in life. The thing is, before my outlook in life was very judgmental, I would look at other people and evaluate what's somebody's character on their behaviour and what they'd done. But when I started smoking green, it changed that perspective where... I saw all my judgments mirrored my own behaviour. So I was kind of like, wow, man. And after all that chaos that I'd caused through my using, I was able to go, wow, man. It kind of it lifted a lid, opened Pandora's box. So... 5 oh, during uh, the white years, though, did we miss there was a tit-for-tat stabbing in the white uh-huh. years? So the thing is, see what... I really failed to identify, and it wasn't until quite recently. But see, when I talk about people that met me in prison or people that meet me outside of prison and they find out I've been in prison, they're always very surprised. They always say, you don't come across as a person that gets prison. They seem I come across quite intelligent, quite friendly. There's always that kind of... this The maths doesn't add up for a lot of people. The one common denom- denominator that I realised... Every time I've went to prison, it's been a result of me being under the influence of white. Every time, because it just, I'm a different person on it. So, after I'd been released for Pullman, probably about six months post-release, I was out drinking one night, and uh, there was a guy there I was friends with, but I wasn't too close friends with him. And what had happened was, the, the girl I had been seeing prior to my sentence in Pullman, he'd slept with her whilst I was in jail. I wasn't really too bothered about it. I was kind of a part, they bother me. It's like, it didn't bother me to a degree. It did a bit, but it wasn't enough for me to make a thing out of it. But uh, we were out drinking one night. This guy was there. He was a bit drunk. And I had been taking white, and this was at that point where I couldn't go I ha- go out and drink without it. And at this point, there'd been periods before it, people would say, you're a different guy on that, but I wouldn't accept it, I wouldn't agree. So, I remember this guy was stoned about drunk, and he had like a two litre of Strombo, and he kind of swung it, and it kind of, a, bit, a, drop, a few droplets went over me, and I says, mate, watch what you're doing with that. And he kind of got a bit aggressive, he kind of says what? And I'm like, I get out of my face, mate. So we've ended up fighting. Fighting each other on that. And uh, there's been a group of people there. So people are quite quick to split that up. But it's been getting, a few punches are getting thrown. It's getting split up. And then we're fighting again. We're rolling about in the ground. And I felt myself getting more and more and more agitated. Because I felt as if any time I got on top of him, I get pulled off him. But whenever he get on top of me, people would leave it, let it go. That's how I felt at the time. So I started getting more and more frustrated. And then when we were getting split up, the guy was shouting a lot of stuff at me that was, at the time, I took very personal. So in the two moments, like when uh, I committed the crime that led to my long-term sentence in Pullman, in this crime, there's been instances where when I'm getting angry, I'll get angry, I'll feel anger building up inside of me, and it's like, as if it's bubbling up like a kettle. But it would get to a point where I'd become so infuriated, well, as if once it reached boiling point, I would suddenly become calm. But once I reached this level of calm, it was like, this guy's getting it, this person's getting it, they're getting done, like, he's getting murdered. He's like, that's, that's the kind of, the, the way I reached it was like this kind of plateau of, right, this guy's getting it. It's like there's no going back. So after a few times we get split up, I just I reached this boiling point. I said, this guy's getting stabbed. I was like, he's getting done. So I was trying to pick up beer bottles and there was picnic chairs. I was trying to smash the bottle off a, a picnic chair. And he's getting away, he's shouting all this stuff. And then 
I've eventually ran down after him and I seen there was this glass bottle it was on the ground it was like a VS bottle and I picked it up and I shouted moan back then and he's ran back up thinking he's getting in a fight and I've suddenly just started attacking him with this bottle putting it in his head and eventually the bottle smashed and I remember when it smashed feeling delight and I was I remember shouting that, that's it there as if yeah I've got what I've wanted and then I've just started sticking it in him and at the time I felt like I was stabbing him in the neck because that's where I was in my head I was aiming for. I, was, I wanted to do the guy damage. Suddenly he's realised he's been stabbed and he's kind of cowered down. And then people have pounced on me. They've just grabbed me. They've wrestled me to the ground and got the, the glass bottle at my hand and thrown it away. And he's been taken away. Then everybody was like, what have you just done? And that way I was still angry. I was like, I, I was kind of, you know what I mean? I wasn't really remorseful or nothing. I was asked what he gets. And we've walked down. Uh, this to my pal's house where I phoned a taxi to come pick me up and I noticed I had some blood around my leg so I thought it was just for him I didn't realise what it was so I've got picked up in this taxi and as the taxi's driving to take me home an ambulance is pulled in front of the taxi with its lights on and started driving so it was him and the ambulance when I get home I realised I looked at my leg and I had a big hole in my leg I don't know how I managed it. It's like I must have stabbed myself in the midst of this melee. I've just been that engrossed in the anger. So next day I went and get taken to the I, I, I took myself to the hospital. I made sure and go to, I went to a different hospital that he was at. And uh, I got stitched up in that. It turns out that I'd stabbed him in the arm. So he was in hospital over the weekend. He had to get an operation in that. And, uh, but the next day I was kind of the same way I felt after the first uh, stabbing that I'd done I was kind of like what have you done what have I done man why have I done that I felt so bad I felt so racked with guilt and shame man and people I was friends with because they were friends of us both and they were kind of avoiding me that way and uh, I suddenly they had that view of me as being unpredictable so after that we hadn't really seen each other, me and this guy. And a few weeks later, I'd been out in like a bender. And I was talking about, this was like a Sunday night and I'd been out the night before drinking and that. And I remember I went to the shops. I was in my friend's house having a drink and I went to the shops to go and get, I think it's in Scotland, the shops stopped serving alcohol at 10 p.m. So I had went to the shops to catch it before it stopped selling alcohol. And then the way back for the shops, I heard like commotion in the park. And I heard this guy shouting. So I had a drink in me and I'm like, all right, moan then. So I've walked into the park and the guys just walked right up to me and like banged me in the heat. And I've just suddenly felt my head, like as if this pressure was coming to my head. My head started bleeding. It stabbed me in the head. It stabbed me. I don't know if you can really see it. It's here. You can't really see it. But see, see doing that part of my hairline, a vein runs down it. So what he'd done, he'd stabbed me in a blood vessel. So instantly blood started gushing from my head. So what he said was, that's us ikis. So in Scotland, we use a term called ikis. It essentially means equal. So he's saying, that's us equal. But you stabbed me, I've stabbed you. But I've just been stabbed. I'm steaming drunk. I was like, not a chance, come here you. So I've started fighting with this guy. And uh, we've been in this fist fight and I'm getting punched. I'm getting punched. I'm losing a lot of blood. I'm punching him. It's just a, it's a fight. And uh, there was people in trying to split it up and that kind of thing. But I was staggering. I was trying to keep my balance. I was drunk and I was losing a lot of blood from my head. So I remember I, we ended up split up and I went away back around to the house I'd just left. And I, I had intent. I was like, I'm going to stab him again. So I went running. I got a kitchen knife. And I ran back round to the park and I was looking for him. And he was away, he'd, he'd gone. And this lassie I knew pulled up and uh, she was like, I'm taking you to the hospital. So I jumped in the car. And when I jumped in her car, I was in the passenger seat. And I had the knife and I think I stuck it in the glove compartment. I either stuck it in the glove compartment or under the seat. I stashed it. Then about five minutes later, as we were driving to the hospital, the police have pulled us with the lights. And they said, right, we've seen you in camera, like, in, like covered in blood and that. We're going to take you to the hospital. So 
she had to get out of her car and the police jumped in her car and drove the car to the hospital. So the police car led the way with the lights. So when I got to the hospital, I got taken in and uh, I just told them I fell in a bit of glass because I wasn't sure what he stabbed me with. So I was worried if he stabbed me with glass, a glass bottle, there might be glass in my head. So but I didn't even want to tell them I'd been stabbed. So I just says, like, I fell in a bit of glass, what I exit. And uh, whilst I was in there, the CID came in, they were questioning me. I actually woke up because I fell asleep and woke up and the CID were talking to me. They were saying, stop pretending you're sleeping. I was like, mate, you just woke me up. <laughs> and then uh, I end up uh, spending the night in hospital. But it actually turns out that when I was in hospital, the police searched this girl's car and they were looking for a knife. So somebody in the CCTV must have seen me running about. So... I spent the night in the hospital and the CID came up again the next day when I'd sobered up and they came to interview me and it was one of the same police officers that arrested me for the attempted murder from my house that came back up, which was a quite a strange 360 moment for that. That uh, After that, a part of me was relieved because before I'd felt guilty of this remorse and this shame for doing this, that boy, I was once class is a pal but now I kind of felt right he's done it back to me that's it's not a desirable outcome for them to involve but it's better than what it was for me so a part of me was kind of right almost felt as if I had a weight off my shoulders to a degree but after that I went back because my mum my dad they all found out my mum stopped speaking to me my dad he fell at me all my family because they were kind of like what are you doing you spent all this time in jail and look at the stuff you're doing so at that point, I kind of got back into the gym. I stayed off it. I didn't really drink much, but uh, it didn't really last long. So eventually, a few months later, I ended up going back into that old cycle. So when I talk about this, it wasn't until like, the last couple of years that I realised, well, how do I keep going to prison? Like, I'm a level-headed guy, and I realise it's the white. It just, whatever it does, it just doesn't react well with me. I'm just chaotic on it and just do stupid stuff. So... And I take you forward to that time I done the shoplifting and get caught. I was on the run for about a year. As I say, I started, I knew how bad the white was for me because for, for me, that way I told myself as if I enjoyed it, but I didn't really realise the amount of bother it got me in. I always blamed external circumstances. I wasn't looking at my own behaviour, my own patterns and my own involvement. So I was on the run for about a year. The police were coming to the door, but I was avoiding them. I was staying with my dad. And uh, I managed to clear a lot of my debts. I managed to, my uncle got me a job as a scaffolder's labourer. So I managed to get decent wages where I could start clearing my debts and that. But my head was still fried because I just swapped one drug for the other. I never enjoyed weed before. I never enjoyed green or anything like that or smoking. I never smoked. But the way I seen it, it was a better alternative than the chaos, but I was still, the odd time I would still use the white, an odd time, but not an everyday user, but it was still, when I would use it, I would end up back in my house for two days with the curtain shut, porn hub, chugging myself into oblivion. It was like, that's what it was like. So, uh, eventually, I was arrested one night. I, I, I was actually quite rough. Well, so rough is basically hung over in Scotland. And I had a come down. So I come down is like being rough from using white. So I remember it was like a Monday. I'd finished work and I went and I got a Chinese. I got a wee bag of all my treats that way, like the, the cure. And when I was walking back to my house, that way I was in, wrapped up in my own bubble of self-pity, of feeling sorry for myself being rough. I turned the corner and I just seen the police van outside my dad's house and two police walking in the garden. They didn't see me, and I turned around and ran away with this Chinese in my hand, ran, got off, and I was kind of like, right, I dodged that one there, and uh, I went back about half an hour later, got home, and I had my munch in that, and I fell asleep. Then I woke up a few hours later, and I heard the door banging, and I looked outside, and I seen the van again. I was like, ah, no way. And so I just ignored that. I was like, ah, right, they'll chap it, then go away. But what they were doing was they had like some kind of 
device they were using to break the lock. So they were essentially breaking into the house. So my dad woke up and he answered the door and they came in and all that, right, we're here to arrest your son. <laughs> and my dad was gone nuts. He was like, ah, who do you think he's are doing this and that kind of thing? And I remember one of the officers, I'll never forget it, he went like to my dad, your son has been evading justice. <laughs> I just At the time, it wasn't funny, but I look back like, what a douchebag, man. I didn't actually speak like that. So I get jailed and then that was me taken to the police station, I was like, ah, oh my God, man, why am I back here again? And uh, there would have been another thing as well. So my neighbour, this is uh, during the time I was on the run, my neighbour had put through a letter through my dad's door, and I had go, it was addressed to my dad, and she was like, ah, listen, can you or your son phone me? It's about the police. And I'm like, ah, what's this? So I phoned her, and... Basically, what had happened was she'd her, so she's lived with her, her husband, but her boy, her son, stayed down the stairs. So it's a four and a block. I think they call it semi detached or whatever. So it's a four and a block. So there's somebody in the bottom left, somebody in the bottom right, tap left, tap right. So four separate houses in this one kind of block. So I, me and my dad stayed in the bottom left block, uh, bottom left house. Her son stayed in the bottom right house, and herself and her husband stayed in the top right house. So the thing is, they had a shared garden. So one night, they heard somebody rustling about in their garden, and they looked out, and they had a boat in their garden, and uh, they seen somebody looked climbing on top of the boat as if trying to get over the fence. They went down to speak to them, and they were like, they said they were the police, but they were wearing plain clothes, and they says, have you got ID? And they says, do you know trust us? And they said, no, because they're obviously a bit, they're not shy of a bit of criminality themselves, so they're like, ah, listen, now shows your ID. So they showed them ID, turns out it was the police. So they says to them, they were like, ah, what can you tell us about your neighbour? And they says, don't know, he's just an older guy, goes to his work, and they says, no, it's no him, it's his son we're talking about, me. So they're like, I don't know what you're talking about, and they says, have you noticed traffic going to and from the door? And they says, nah, I don't know, it's nothing. So... They let me know this, and I was like, ah, right, what's going down? Because I'd been up to about a bit of shifty business, but I was worried. I was like, right, I'm not doing anything to a level where I'm going to have that kind of suspicion on me. So I spoke to my lawyer, and he said, basically, they were trying to gain access to your house to either take something out of it or place like a device in there, like a, like a bug or something. So he's like, somebody's stuck you in for whatever you're doing. So... When I get arrested for this, uh, this shoplifting and this knife, I was like, what's going on here? Because like, when I get taken to the police station, it was that anxiety again. It's no, what have I got in front of me? It's, what else have they got? So I remember I was in the cell and they went like that, and I went to use the toilet and they says, we've got something else to want to speak to you about. And I was like, here we go. And uh, when I went to the cell to use the toilet, and like that, I just got to bring it up the notes of vandalism. I'm like, what? Like, so basically, I had been owed a sum of money by somebody, and this isn't connected to the them trying to get into my house because I realised that right away. See, the minute he told me, I was actually relieved. Basically, a guy owed me a sum of money, and he'd been basically messing me about. So one night, I decided I was going to go to his house. So I went armed with a mallet. And I walked to his house, he stayed not far from me. It was in the middle of the night. And I ran up to his windows with this mallet and smashed all the windows with the mallet. But as I've smashed one window, one of the shards have came loose and went right into my hand. So I don't know if you can kind of see that. It's like, there's a scar, see that there? So that was, there was blood everywhere. I ran away, I think I dropped the mallet. That's the thing as well. See, when I talk about my crimes, I was never a good criminal. I was never one of the forward-thinking criminals. I got caught every time because I was so bad at it. So, he basically, they wanted to charge me with that. That's what it was. But then, it, the penny didn't drop, I didn't. But I was kind of relieved, like, right, this is what else they were looking for me for. But then I was like, why were they in my house? I think I've identified as the reason they were at my house is because, no, because of what I was doing, maybe somebody who I was involved with, but I'll not get into that too much. But, I went to court and that's my lawyer came and seen me 
And he's like, ah, right, this is your third knife charge. In Scotland, they take knife crime pretty seriously. And he's like, ah, it's not looking good. I'd be surprised if you get it. So there's a thing in like, Scottish courts, you'll get like a travelling judge. So you have your, your stable of judges that will reside in like Glasgow Sheriff Court. But you'll maybe have a travelling judge that will maybe do a shift in Glasgow Sheriff or they'll do a shift somewhere else. Naturally, a travelling judge isn't from like, the area of Glasgow. So they don't really deal with knife crime as much. They're a bit more lenient, a bit more relaxed. So when I went out for a bail hearing, I was in the petition court. I was in front of a travelling judge. So I remember when I went in, in the dock, because I was expecting to get remanded, and uh, the PF, she gave me a smile, and I was like, oh, she smiled at me. It's quite nice. And then she got up and absolutely tore me a new man, absolutely tore me to pieces. But I remember my lawyer, he came up to me, and this is always a good indication. He says, have you got any holidays planned? And I said, no. He's like, right. So usually when they ask that, it's because you're going to get bail. So I got bail, and I was buzzing. I, d I didn't have a coffee or nothing. I got it. I get bailed and I was that way. See, because I've been on the run for so long, like a year, in my head, it was always in the back of my mind. I couldn't relax because the police could pop up at any time. I was still, they call it punting in Glasgow and Scotland. So punting's when you're dealing. So there was periods where I was punting. I had stuff on me, the police would be about. And it was just, it was just a pure year of anxiety and nerves. And you just don't know. You couldn't plan ahead because you always had that in the back of your mind. So, I wasn't ducking and diving and hiding for police. So at that point, I felt as if, right, I can focus. I ended up going to Amsterdam, went out the country. It was a mad, that was a mad experience. And uh went up, got to Amsterdam. I, I booked it the minute. As soon as I got done with that, I, I got out and booked a flight with my two pals. Probably the daftest thing I've ever done. Missed the flight there and missed the flight back. This is another thing It's like, I ended up over there the same time as Rangers. So Rangers is a big football club in Scotland. They were playing a uh, Feyenoord. So I ended up just hunting as a Glaswegians in Amsterdam. Went over there and uh, the last night, you know what it's like. Last night, take it easy. Last night always ends up the most chaotic. Ended up abandoning the flight home. Woke up in Amsterdam with no money. Nothing to get home. I put a suitcase. Ended up sleeping in Amsterdam airport. I was literally at that point, I was sitting like, I can't keep doing this stuff. I had tears in my eyes like, oh, why do I keep doing this stuff? I had to get my brother to book me a flight to Milan to get a flight to Edinburgh. The next day, I had to sleep in the airport. Overnight, my phone ran out of battery. I had to sleep outside the shop that sells phone chargers because I had to get my phone charged to get my tickets. It was hellish. So... Eventually, fast forward a bit, lockdown came into play. So, the fact that lockdown came in, in my case, would have been June 2020 to go to court. I decided to take it through trial because I felt if I plead not guilty to this, it's possible this case might get abandoned. I wasn't that lucky. Uh, uh, eventually, the case rolled back around in 2021. And I thought, my lawyer's like, oh, listen, if you get a guilty, you're going to jail. There's no two ways about it. So I was up in front of a high court judge and the sheriff. The reason for this was because of there was such a backlog of the cases from COVID and that, they drafted in judges to help try and kind of take the take the pressure off. So I was on a petition case in the sheriff court, but in front of a high court judge. So I took it through trial, tried my best to get acquitted, tried to manifest it. Actually, the day I went up for my verdict, I'd planned my day out. You know what I mean? I plan. I was going to get a sunbed and all that. When I go up and I get a not guilty for this or that. So I get fun guilty. Uh, gutted, I was very scunnered to get found guilty. Then, because I was still quite shocked that I get found guilty. Then the minute I get found guilty, the judge remanded me. I was like, ah, no way. I just went for getting guilty to getting remanded. So the instant I get found guilty... The judge up until that point, I felt was nice and lovely. She was a woman, like an older woman, so nice and lovely, nice and kind, nice and... I felt as if she was on my side. The minute I got found guilty, it just looked, she switched and she just, just changed into a pure... And she was like, ah, listen, a child like this can carry a maximum of five years and all that. And because she was a high court judge and I had a high court conviction, she was pointing to that as if, like, right, 
this is a bad thing. So I got demanded and I went to Berlin again and it was that feeling like I, I, it's the most gutted I've ever been in my life. Because at this point, pardon me, I had uh, started a podcast. I'd been doing a lot of positive stuff in my life. I'd felt as if I really had purpose and meaning and direction in life. So that way I felt as if everything was going well for me, that this had pure derailed the momentum. So I remember going to prison that night and this is... There was the COVID guidelines were still very much in place. So what it worked out as the they call it dub up in Scotland. So lock up when the jail locks up and you go behind your door, you can't get access to the phone, nothing like that. Rather than being at 9 p.m., it was at 5 p.m. And when you went to the first night centre, it wasn't one night you were there. It was now a quarantine centre. You had to go there for 10 days. So I was in this place. I was dubbed up with this guy and uh, it was just when I was in, he fell asleep quite early, so I was just awake. The TV was on with Film 4 and Transformers was on, and it was that grainy picture, and I'm like, ah, this is hellish, man. <laughs> and I remember just sitting thinking to myself, like, how can I get out of this situation? How did I do it? And I thought came to me, like, write the judge a letter. Just write the judge a letter and just say, listen, like, what you've got going on, how you're sorry and that. That's what I done, I wrote the judge a letter. And uh, I was only doing a three-week remand, but that's when I decided, right, I was like, I'm going to try and do my best. I got a lot of character references for people on projects I'd worked on, and uh, I got all the input together to try and give me the best possible chance, because I was like that, I can't deal with this stuff. It was just before, whenever I'd went to jail, in my head, it was like, right, I'm here. I've done it. It was kind of young, immature, didn't really bother. It's not, I didn't have much outside. So what I thought, I didn't have much outside that I didn't really have many goals or purpose outside that really made a difference to me being in jail. But this time, I, my life was different. So eventually I went up to court and I got sentenced to 14 months. The judge looked at all my character references and she showed me leniency, a fair play her. And uh, I got 14 months and that way it worked out. I would have been out that year if I got the tag. So uh, well, I would have been out that year, in fact, because I only done seven months. So my release date was Christmas Eve. I think it was 2021. So I was relieved in that sense. Obviously, I was hoping that I'd get out, but I ended up getting a job in the jail radio station. And what I'd done in there is basically a producer. So that's where I first started kind of producing stuff. I started making shows and that kind of thing. And I actually found out that the shows I made during that sentence the radio station still used to this day, this day as a guide for new prisoners that are starting in the radio station. So that's my legacy in Berlin. Did you hook up with the Kersler Arts people? The who? Kersler Arts. They help prisoners. Uh, Kessler? Use... Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, Kessler, that's that accent there. It makes it sound like a different word. <laughs> I think I so I think I sent some pieces of work away to the Kessler Awards. Uh, I never. That was uh, the first time I was in Berlin because uh, when you said that there, it just it just one of my shows won a Kessler Award. I can just big yeah, myself up. Know and, what I mean? and, and viewers, viewers, uh, please support the Kessler Trust. They do really good work helping prisoners rehabilitate through art. I know, one hundred percent, man, and yeah. definitely like, gives people something to work towards in prison. So where I worked in that area and the, the radio station, it was a really positive place. Like the screws were a lot more laid back, and they were just a lot more supportive. Uh, I've not really been in touch with him since I've been out. I think I went in once, right when I was still on the tag, because I eventually got the tag, and uh, that's how I set up my podcast. Right now I'm in my podcast studio. I set this up while stone tag because it worked out perfectly because I didn't have to go to a studio and arrange certain times and that kind of thing. I could just do it from the comfort of my house. So if people go and watch my podcast, premeditated part, they'll see a lot of the earlier episodes. I'm wearing my tag. <laughs> how did you manage not to go back to the white man so I'd love to say that was enough for me and uh, once I left that sentence I never touched it again I think I was uh, a week later back on it and it wasn't like I would take it back to the everyday usage but if I had a drink I would still take it it would just it would pop up I would just as I say I'd have a drink and that urge to take it would come I kind of dabbled with like green, as I say, I kind of stopped smoking green. I started to develop psychosis with that before I got that last sentence. I was start, it was weird. It was like I was starting to 
think people could hear what I was thinking and all that kind of stuff. But I kind of managed to like nip it in the bud, pardon the pun, just before I actually became something serious. So, but it was still giving me a fright. But when I was getting out, it was like, if I'd end up drinking and taking white, I'd end up smoking green to try and take away the come down. And it just end up that, that cycle, I'd get a couple of weeks off it. Then I'd end up drinking. Then when I drank, I'd take white. Then when I'd come down, I'd end up smoking green. And then I'd get half that. Then it was just a cycle to the point where it was like, I tried every method under the sun twice, tried everything, tried to avoid people, trying to deleted people off of social media, I tried to microdose mushrooms, all that stuff, and just nothing was working. And eventually I came into touch with some people that were in recovery. They were uh, they'd wait at meetings like uh, CAA and all that kind of stuff. So, But when I first met these people, it was kind of, it wasn't on like a, a recovery basis. They were in recovery, but it was like to do with music and stuff like that. So I kind of got like, a bit more knowledge about it, and I was kind of I ended up going to like, a CA meeting after the back of one come down that way, and I think everybody does is after the back of a hangover that's the one too many hangovers or one too many come downs, and I went to it, and I just it was just I felt so so much anxiety, and I just felt terrible because I've got a come down, I'm going to this meeting. It's like when you go to meetings, usually when you go to a crowded room, a social event as such, a lot of people kind of try to suss you out, they're judging you. I've been on both sides of that that judgment. But when you walk into these meetings, you're just overwhelmed with the support. People want to shake your hand. People want to get to know you. People want to make you feel welcome, which can be quite uncomfortable for people like us that aren't used to it. So I went to a meeting, and then I just, as soon as the come down went away, I went away, was like, ah, nah, that's not for me. So eventually it got to a point where I had no control over whether I was going to use or I wasn't going to use. I ended up seeing this girl. She was from Edinburgh. Really nice girl. I got on really well with her. And one night, I ended up going with someone behind her back. And whilst I was under the influence of uh, drink and white, and the next day, the minute I woke up, I was just racked with guilt and shame. I just couldn't believe what I'd done. I felt so bad. So immediately I told her what had happened. She finished things, obviously. And uh, at that point, I suddenly just didn't trust myself. Before, I could have said, well, I've done this, I've done that, but I wouldn't do that and I wouldn't do this. When I looked at that situation, that was something I would never have done. Would have never have done. When I heard, heard of people doing it to people, I always thought, like, why? How do you do that? Suddenly I'd done something I said I would never do. So suddenly I just couldn't trust myself. I'm like, right, if I could do that, what else can I do? So that's when I decided, right, I'm going to take action on this. So I started to throw myself into meetings. And at first I started microdosing like mushrooms, magic ones. And uh, I felt as if, right, if I go to the meetings and microdose this, then I'll be able to stay off it. So I was going to meetings thinking I was on this higher plane People were coming in saying they were relapsing. I was like, ah, morons. I've got, I've got the formula. I've got the cure. Naturally, I ended up relapsing. I would say, I don't, I, I use the term relapsing. I was never really clean to relapse, but I ended up going back in the green. And when they talk about recovery, they talk about like, addiction has been like, a sen- uh, experience, a sen- experiencing a sensation, like a loss of control. And that's when I realised it, like, right, this is, I have got this, this illness, they call it, because when I started smoking green again, it was like I had never put it down. But it wasn't like there was a tolerance break where I was, it was like both, and it was like more than ever to a point where it was just, it was chronic and it was kind of worrying. So I eventually got myself back into recovery. And uh, what you do is you get a sponsor. So you do like a 12 step programme and you'll find a sponsor. There's somebody that's done the programme that will take you through the book. So I had met my sponsor before there was any idea to to ask him to be a sponsor. So I was acting in a, an independent production called Supply and Demand, and they would host the workshops out in Edinburgh because the director, Gary Fraser, was there. He would uh, host these workshops, and I would go through every week to rehearse. And one day I met 
my sponsor there, and he was acting in a scene. That's the first time I met him. Then, uh, well, I, I think it was like a few days later, I met him in a meeting. So I had met him like twice in the one week, and then I got him on my podcast because he's uh, trauma-informed. He's got a really great story, really interesting guy, very intelligent. So I had him on my podcast, so I kind of had a, a relationship with him. And uh, then eventually somebody just says to me, like, why don't you ask him to be your sponsor? It just didn't click. It was like, ah, Eureka, why don't I ask him? So I asked him to be my sponsor. That was about end of November last year. And he done it. Uh, just told me what I had to do. I had to go to meetings and that. If I had any issues, any problems, to phone him. And that's what I done, man. So uh, that's uh, been a year. I've been clean of everything, man. And seeing that year, my life has transformed remarkably. Mm. It's like I've just been so productive. So as I say, I've got that obsessive mindset. Like where substances, they stimulate the brain to the point where you don't need external stimulation for anything else. But now I've not got that synthetic stimulation. I need my passion projects to keep my brain stimulated. So I'm able to focus on them. And before, when I was working in various projects as such, like, see, it, my life would be like a Jenga block. Like, I would go a couple of weeks not drinking or that, and it'd be like pulling blocks out of Jenga. Then eventually when I did drink, it would, like that Jenga block would collapse and I would need to rebuild it again. So I've been able to sustain stability in uh, my projects, my podcasts. I'm able to focus. Then eventually I get the call for banged up. So... I built up quite a good following on TikTok, just with consistency with my videos and that kind of stuff. Help me. And uh, one of the producers of Banged Up, they seen a video I was taught about. I think I was taught about that guitar. I think, so on TikTok, you can reply back to a comment with a video. So I think someone asked me about where did I learn guitar or something like that. And I replied back telling the story about how I was in prison and I acquired this guitar. And one of the producers seen it, emailed me, and they told me, Right, I'm looking for people to take part in this show. There's going to be celebrities. It's going to be in a prison environment. We want to highlight the issues surrounding the jail and that kind of thing. And all I seen was Channel 4, celebrities, prison, <laughs> sign me up. The way I seen it, I thought it was going to be a, like, a big brother in the jail. I'm like, right, they'll get us today, tasks and activities and all. It'll be funny. So I was like, right, I've got the, the qualifications and the experience for this. Well, like I'm constant on camera, I'm funny, I'm witty, and I've been in jail, so I'm like, I tick all these boxes. <laughs> so the process for that was, it was all very, uh, see to be honest, and I think everybody shares this, it's like, it was very secretive. They wouldn't tell us who the celebrities were. They hinted at uh, maybe a pop singer. They hinted at a Tory MP. But that show, it's, it was an experiment, but I felt as if, and I wasn't the only one for me. I had to feel as if I was filling in the blanks myself. He says, right, you're going to be in jail for 10 days and it's to give these celebrities a taste of the jail life. We want you to give them a hard time and that kind of thing. What would you do if you were in a cell with a Tory MP? All these questions and that. And uh, so when I was getting geared up for it, I was just like, right, what is actually going on here? I don't really know. So the process from when I was first contacted for Banged Up, to the moment I stepped foot in the jail was very, very quick. They contacted me, then anybody that's done TV, probably yourself, Sean, you realise that like, when you they, they approach you to like, do a TV show, they'll usually schedule a Zoom call where they can speak to you firsthand, find out a bit more about you, they'll maybe edit that into a wee collage or a wee montage and they'll take it to their, their bosses and they'll have the final say so. So there was that, then they asked me to come down to London because they wanted to meet me in person because I think they might have seen my previous and thought, right, we want to see this guy face to face. So everything went well then in the lead up to it, they gave us a date. Well, I think it was June. I can't remember the exact date. I think it was the end of June, middle mid-June, summer. And uh, well, all right, getting ready to go in. Is there any stuff that you want us to get? So they're basically doing a shopping run for us. So I was going down, they, they, they hired a car, a taxi company to pick me up for Glasgow and drive me down south to Shrewsbury. And when I was heading there, they were like, right, you can't tell the driver, you can't tell anybody where you're going. But I did tell some people because I can't go off the radar for 10 days. People are going to think I went missing. Nothing to talk about. So 
when I got there, I remember arriving and I remember them saying to me, right, we want you to bring some contraband in. Like, treat it as if you're going to jail. What would you sneak in? So I'm like, right, obviously in my head, I'm going to sneak in a phone. But I realised I'm like, right, I need to represent the Scottish people. So can you see that flag there, that, that one there? I was like, I'm going to sneak my Scotland flag in. <laughs> so the plan was to put it up my backside. But see when I wrapped up that flag with, a, with an iPhone, I'm like, ah, right, I might be four and a half ounce of dope, but I'm no a Scottish flag in an iPhone 6. So, and it'd been a bit of time, no? I mean, I've, I hadn't stretched that capacity, I hadn't practiced. So I ended up just putting it in a pencil case and putting it down my balls. So I got there and suddenly I realised, because I thought it was just going to be all these ex-cons, which it was, but I didn't realise it was all ex-cons, like Shet Sandu, like, Lewis Clark, all people that I'd watched on podcasts and such, uh, Rich Jones, all these people, people I'd, I'd heard their stories, so it was quite interesting. I was like, ah, see. So suddenly it became a lot more interesting because we were all kind of clueless, like, right, what's going on here? So they split us into groups and they were like, right, basically we were in like this big gym hall before it. They gave us all the prison garment, this, these grey tops and grey joggies. And they're like, ah, right, eh. Uh, they just explained the situation and I remember they were saying stuff like, right, we want you to give the celebs a hard time, bully them, make, make it feel like they're in a new jail, but there can't be any violence, even between each other. If there's any violence, you're immediately off the show. And they says, look, if you see a situation that might arise into violence, just go and tell the prison officers and they can let us know. And I swear to God, you could have heard a pin drop and then suddenly the place just erupted into laughter. Everybody just started laughing, man. Like, uh, these people haven't got a clue. Seriously, man, because as much as Shine TV, the producers and that, really nice people, not one of them had stepped foot in a jail before. They had no idea. And we were all, for myself, I, I was probably, I've served four and a half years of my life in jail. I was in probably one of the lower marks of like served time. There's people that had done 10 years, Kev Lane, ex-lifer. So people had done some serious time there. So they briefed us for it and that kind of thing, but we were still, me personally, I was still a bit kind of, right, what's actually going to happen here? Because I was under the impression, right, they're going to want good television. They're going to want content. They're not going to just stick us in a jail and put us in cells 24 hours a day and leave us. That's going to be crap daily. So to my surprise, I found out they put us in cells for 24 hours, left us, and we'd done nothing. We get put in cells, like literally, the first night, so the cameras weren't going to start rolling till the next day, so the day upon arrival, we went into the cells, and I remember, two of the prison officers, they came onto the wing, and they met us, one was uh, Miss Morell, the blonde haired, screw, I don't know if you might have seen on the programme, she was there, and there was this other guy, right, so immediately they came on with the uniform on and immediately my guard just went up as soon as I seen the uniform. I'm one of the people like, I'll treat people with respect as I take them. In a prison environment, I get a bit worried. See if I'm talking to a screw for too long myself, I try and minimise conversation because if someone looking from a distance sees that, no, I mean, the, they call it Chinese whispers. The rumours could start circulating, so... I always try and keep my interaction to a minimum or if I'm way another con, then I can talk a bit more. That's just a, 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 a natural guard thing I've got. So as soon as they come on the wing, I was kind of right. That way I had my eyes on them. So that night, the this guy, this screw, right, somebody had hit the button and asked him to give him a light, well, a light for his, his cigarette. And that screw said, no, I'm not giving you. So the guy's like, ah, this guy's one of the cons. Guy's like, ah, open my door then. And the guy says, I'm not opening your door. So this guy has lost the rag. He's picked up a chair in the cell, smashed it, smashed through the wee, see the wee window in your door. So see the doors? They were locked from the outside. They weren't locked by key, but by handle. So if you're able to get your hand through the, the, the wee plastic panel that's on the door, you could let yourself out. And that's what this guy done. He smashed through this panel, opened the door and chased the screw out the wing. Then he started opening everybody up. 
He's like, yeah, that's this mad nother guy. Insecurity, because they had, a, they had a, a cell full of security just in case things got hairy. And the security came out and the guy threatened security. So he opened her hatch. I was dubbed up with a guy, Lee Meredith, a great guy from Bristol, who opened her hatch. So we were watching this carnage unfold. We seen the producers. This is like 10 o'clock at night. We seen the producers. They had their bags and their jackets. They were just getting ready to go home. And they had to deal with this situation. So this guy ended up getting popped off the show before the camera started rolling. Mad Tony, some guy, he get, he get popped off the show. And then we were like, All right, this must be a sign of things to come. So uh, the next day when the camera started rolling, I think the first guy in my cell was Tony Gooch. He was the first guy like, right in the cell. It was just that was him laughing, man. And then uh, at the start, I was like, All right, how's this going to go? Right, I think with the first day, the novelty was still there because we're like, All right, we're on jail. And you know that way you get to know people, you're like, All right, how's this actually going to go? So within about the second day, though, nothing much had really happened. We'd been locked up quite a lot, we'd been shifted about rooms and all that kind of stuff. The celebrities hadn't arrived yet. So I remember being in the cell. And Liam, my co-pilot, he'd get taken to like an anger management class. And I was kind of, I was needing anger management because he'd been taken to this class. I'm like, why am I not going to this class? How am I left in the cell? So I started to get really annoyed. And I'm like, I've dubbed up here, done nothing wrong. Like, and I started trying to hatch a plot in my head. I was like, ah, right, I'm going to need to go out of this cell. I'm going to run up the stairs and try and get in the roof. And then I was imagining myself, I'll just start flipping tiles off this roof. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute, I can just leave. I don't, I'm not in jail, I can just leave this. But it was weird, it was like, as I think called the Stanford experiment, you might have heard of it, where uh, they've done this psychology experiment where they split a, a psychology class into like, prisoners and uh, prison officers. And within two days, it descended into anarchy. You had prisoners doing protests, you had prison officers bullying the, the prisoners, then they had to shut it down because they went into that environment, that kind of mindset, and they adapted to it. I felt like that, and I, I'm not the only one. There was, uh, see the producers? The producers would wear prison uniform, prison officer uniform, but all they would be doing is handing out uh, or microphones and stuff like that. It's just for continuity for the cameras, and plus to tie in with experiments, so we're no in a jail and you've got people in plain clothes walking up to you, so that way it kind of kept it real. There was a producer there, Lauren, I'm sure her name was, and I had met her at the Shine TV office in London when I'd done my like, interview with them. So I knew her as a producer, but see, when she was wearing the prison officer uniform, I, I couldn't see her as a producer. She looked like a screw, and I was like, anytime I walked by her, I'd be kind of shifty around her. She was even noticing it was mental, it was crazy. So two days into it, people were going nuts because you've got a TV production running a jail. And as I've said before, jails need to run on routine. And a TV production does not know routine, nor does it know schedule. So we were spending like copious amounts of time locked up, no exercise, nothing. So people were really losing the rag. So two days into it, the production called this big meeting. And they were kind of like, ah, listen, remember why you're here? We're making a TV show, man, let's work together. And that kind of reset the balance for a lot of people. What well, right eye, but a lot is got to say, listen, what's going on here? But I still think the production were finding their feet. The I think the first celeb that came into jail was Harvey. And it was like as soon as the celebs entered, that's when it kind of it made it a bit more interesting for us. Whereas before that, we were just in jail. But no, right, we've got a purpose. And Harvey bless him, man. He's like just a young boy, he's like the UK Justin Bieber. But as soon as you've seen him, man, obviously you've got all these ex-cons, these pure hardened criminals, and we Harvey kicking about a wee pop star. He's never done a day in jail, and it's just you could see the pure innocence in his face. <laughs> it was that was quite um that was quite a good point of the show to watch that. And the the other guy who came in as well, um, who fought he was the goggle box guy and he fought and Marcus. He said he was going to bring his energy in where, the, where there was darkness. He was going to bring his light in and transform everybody. Uh, light in a dark <laughs> place. I cunts hated that. People hated that. I can see when he said that. I, I wasn't there when he said that. But see, after that, people were taught about it. Like, Why would you make that guy saying that? So, see, fair play to him. See, I think a lot of them came in. Apart, Harvey kind of settled in. He was just kind of going with the flow. 
the likes of Peter, maybe Peter Hitchens, Marcus Sido, and he was kind of all right. Uh, I would say Marcus and Peter, maybe they came in with these preconceptions, but I feel their attitudes changed to a degree. Look, like Marcus, he kind of realised near the end, oh, wait a minute, man, this is there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. So I think I humbled them in that respect, man, but I was, I think it took a bit of getting used to for Marcus and I. Yeah, the energy in the, even like, you know, you see people come in, even the guards who come in who, who, who are like well-meaning, within six months their faces have turned to stone and they're part, it's all us versus them mentality and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. every I... present danger, it just, it does something to you, doesn't it? You, it's not, you can't just come in and change the atmosphere of one person, there's no way. I uh, know, I know, no as, as if like, oh, has nobody thought of this before, you just go in, you just change it and then that'll sort it, lad, <laughs> Eureka, you've got it mate, on you go mate, we'll get you in the jail and you can go and change it for us all. But he had, he had good intentions, I'll give him that. <laughs> nah, no, fair play to him, fair play to him. And, and as I say, at the end, he did, well, midway through, he did actually realise he's kind of like, right, it's not as if he's stuck to his uh, preconceptions, because you know what yourself, Sean, it's, we all, like, even me, before I went into jail, had this preconception of what it's like, but that's the thing I felt they highlighted quite well with Sid Owen. See, people, myself included, see, before I went to jail, I had this vision of like, the TV shows you would see where it's association and people in the gym and people working and always socialising. A lot of jailers sitting in a cell with nowhere to go, with nowhere to get out the cell, or, or thinking of ways that you can get your door open for five minutes to get on the phone, asking to mop your floor just so you can get your door open, just so you can talk to someone. They highlighted that quite well with Sid. It's that like you don't actually realise that when you see people doing like 10, 20 a year, they're doing a lot of it just in a room when they wait to leave it. <laughs> yeah, I thought Hitchens said some silly things in the class about the green. He said mm. every ter- every terrorist has been on the green. I was like, oh no! And uh, then Shet just walks out. <laughs> I, know. I don't know. I can see the thing is as well. They cut a bit of what Shet Shet went through, him, man. Shet went through him with a, with a fucking a hot iron. I can see it's obviously got a CBD company, but he did not take well to that at all, man. What one of the best bits was when Shet was telling his Sally how to make a shank, and he's like. Get him in the eye. I got me a retina. Got my retina. And then he's got him practicing on the wall. <laughs> uh, see, see that thing with Shet and Neil as well, man. See Shet and Neil. They couldn't have picked people that are more shocking. Jeez, you've got Neil. He's a farmer, ex-Tory MP. He's an older man, and Shet obviously Shet. But when they first get padded up, I think Shet was giving him a hard time at first. But then I think Shet started to warm towards him. Then, as I say, became quite protective. But they're actually quite friendly now they're in good terms which is a, a crazy thing see things like that it's like you couldn't have planned that to happen but it's just yeah, one of the she- unlikely things that just happened as, as a result of this check contact me a couple of nights ago he's doing an event actually um 12th of january out of london and i think Dwayne, the guy you mentioned on the first night who smashed the door he's gonna be like tony gonna be, yeah tony and uh, it'd be good if you could get Hitchens and Neil to go as well. I think that that'd make it. Uh, I think really Neil might be turning up. I think Neil might be turning up. I don't know about Peter, but I don't know if he's <laughs> unless there's plenty of security, so he can start talking about the green. Know what I mean? They've invited me to host it. I'm also going to be hosting Michael Francis in Glasgow next year. So come along, man. We can uh, have a have a chat. Yeah. Ah, nice. I'd be up for that. Port line. Whereabouts in Glasgow is it? So. I don't have the information in front of me, but it's doing really well. I think Glasgow, he's doing 15 gigs across the UK. Mm-hmm. And I think Glasgow is the one that's selling the most tickets. Is it, eh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Big fascination good... with the old school mafia in Glasgow. I uh, love about a mafia yeah, up in Glasgow, yeah. not of it. I know, definitely. I'll pop along to that. If, uh, is it, is the date been released for it yet? When is it about? Yeah, six, it's on Eventbrite if people want it. I'll put a link in the description box. Um, it's on Eventbrite if people want tickets. But Michael Francis, as portrayed in Goodfellas, he was characterised. But we like to finish 5 on some lessons for the young people. What would you say to teenagers who attempted to get into the knife, the gangs, the white powder? Have you got any advice for them about the consequences? Aye, man. It's just, it's not worth that at all, man. See, knives, if you want to get in a fight, go to a boxing gym. You'll get plenty of fights in there. Day Muay Thai, day kickboxing or something. You'll get all that angst energy out and you develop a, a certain level of respect for your fellow human and plus with knives it's a mugs game 
as it's never, you're either going to be on the wrong end of a knife, doing a very long sentence, or dead. And it's like that is just the outcome, the natural outcome. It's like having a packet of packet of sweeties in your pocket. Well, it's a packet of smarties or whatever you want to call it. It's like if I'm hungry, I'll naturally go and make myself a nourishing meal. But if I'm hungry and I'm outside and I've got a packet of sweeties in my pocket, I'll go into that pocket and eat the sweeties. If I'm angry and I've got a knife in my pocket and I'm in a fight, very easy to pull a knife out and stab somebody. And you can't, no matter people I've met that are doing like 15, 20 year life sentences, that they're just the same as me and never been out prepared to kill anybody. Never pre never prepared to use a knife, just had it on them in the wrong place at the wrong time and you know, they're wasting a good portion of their life with it. It's like, find a purpose, man. Find a passion in life. It's like, and if you don't know what your passion or purpose is, try something. Find, try something that might interest you. See if you don't like it, you can see you tried. And that's what life is. Life is uh, a cocktail of experiences. So choose the positive ones because I can tell you, jail is a lot of sitting about that somebody has pressed pause in your life. The world goes on without you. You just stop in time. Your body ages, but that's it. You don't achieve nothing. You just sit there stuck in the sand whilst you watch your family get older, your friends go and mature, achieve things, man. And I, it's just a horrible, depressing existence. And I was one of the lucky ones. I done four and a half year all in. And to some people, it's a long, long time, but it is a fair bit of time. But I feel as if it could have been much longer if I was a bit more unlucky. So I. Take it for me, you know what I mean? Do something positive with your life, you'll never regret it. Well said, man. And yeah, that's really important to point out. Like you did four and a half, but when you were involved, that knife could have done some damage that killed that person and you'd still be inside there right now. So people have got to realize it's just playing the lottery, isn't it? The people who are in, the people who are out, if the damage is done and they die, it's all over for you. There's no way around it. So, and it's too late by then. You can't go crying to your mama. So basically, what for the people who've sat here for the last three hours and listened to your story, which you've told so well, a huge thank you for spending so much time with us. No, thank you, man. Where can they find you on your socials and support you and, and watch your podcast, etc.? So if you want to get me on TikTok, uh, my username is at Fawaii, F-A-W-A-I-I underscore H-I-V-O. On everything else is at Hawaii underscore five o. The reason why the TikTok one is different is because I've been repeatedly banned and I need to get creative with my usernames. If you want to hear me chat in more detail about my life and chat to other guests from every walk of life imaginable, my podcast is on Spotify and YouTube, Premeditated Patter. So it's premeditated. If you can spell that, I'll just let you pick up a dictionary. And patter, P A T T E R. Patter in Scotland is basically banter. So premeditated patter. And uh, I make music as well. You can get me on Spotify, on SoundCloud, F I V O. All of five of those links are in the description box below this video. If you're watching it on the YouTube version, please support what he's doing. And if you're up in Glasgow, come and see us at the Francis gig. I'll put the link down there as well. Take care, wherever you are in the world. Much love and respect. Let us know in the comments what you thought about this video. Cheers again. Like, subscribe, and don't get wide, people. Catches. <laughs>